Good morning and welcome to the City Planning Commission Remote Public Hearing. Uh, today, October 7th, 2020, Ryan Singer, our Senior Director of Land Use and Commission Operations, will now outline general information about the remote public hearing and how to participate. Ryan? Yep. Uh, verbal testimony uh, may be provided online through the NYC Engage portal or by calling on your telephone. If you wish to speak and plan to access the hearing online, please register online through the upcoming meetings page of the NYC Engage portal. A link to join the hearing will be emailed to you after you've completed the registration process. If you're accessing the hearing via phone and wish to speak, you must first register with the dial-in participant hotline at 1-877-853-5247, that's US toll free. The meeting ID is 618-237-7396. Press pound to skip the participation ID and the password is the numeral one. The phone number is also posted on the upcoming meetings page of the NYC Engage portal. Please note that whether you're accessing the meeting online or by phone, you must register uh, if you want to speak. Uh, please also note that your testimony will be audio only. Uh, the commissioners will hear you, but will not be able to see you. Uh, when it is your turn to speak, you will be notified and granted temporary speaking privileges by staff, but please listen closely for your name to be called. If you are accessing the hearing online, your name will be called from the list of registered speakers. Once your name has been called, uh, you will be able to unmute yourself and you should see a notice on your screen allowing you to unmute your microphone. Uh, if you're accessing the hearing via phone, your name will be called from the list of registered speakers once your name has been called, you will be given the ability to unmute yourself. To do this, press star six to unmute your phone. Uh, when your testimony is complete or your three minutes have expired, uh, you will be muted again. Please note that muting and unmuting registered speakers may take a moment as we are adjusting to this new hearing format. So thank you for your patience. For those accessing the hearing through the online live stream, who have not registered to speak, but decide they wish to do so during the hearing, you must first register to speak through the upcoming meeting page of the NYC Engage portal. It is not possible to testify uh, through the online live stream without first having registered. For those accessing the hearing via phone who have not yet registered to speak, but wish to do so, you must first register to speak through the dial-in participant hotline that I described a moment ago. It is not possible to testify via telephone without first having registered. You'll be notified when you can unmute your microphone. Uh, please classify your testimony as in favor or in opposition and indicate if you're speaking on behalf of another person or a group. Please limit your remarks to three minutes. Speak clearly into your microphone. There are a few exceptions to the three minute time limit. Elected officials are accorded the courtesy of jumping into the front of the queue and are not limited to three minutes. If translation services are being used, and that includes ASL, um, the time will be extended to five minutes. And if an applicant team with three or more speakers wishes to make a team presentation, the team will be generally allowed a total of 10 minutes. The chair will announce when the time limit is reached, at which point your microphone will be muted. Please be mindful of potential background noise during your testimony. Please make sure that if you're watching the proceedings via live stream, that the live stream is muted when you begin your testimony. Otherwise, you'll hear at. If you wish to submit written testimony, it should be submitted to the Department of State Planning. Mailing and email address can be found at our website, planning.nyc. Gov. Lastly, please note that this remote public hearing and all testimony is being recorded. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, Madam Secretary, please begin the meeting. Good morning, Mr. Vice Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. This is the City Planning Commission public meeting. 
held remotely through the NYC Engage portal. Today is Wednesday, October 7, 2020. I will now call the roll. Vice Chairman Knuckles. Here. Commissioner Bernie. Here. Commissioner Capelli. Here. Commissioner Cerullo. Here. Commissioner De La Luz. Here. Commissioner Dweck. Here. Commissioner Eady. Here. Commissioner Knight. Here. Commissioner Levin. Here. Commissioner Marie. Commissioner Marie. Here. Here. I am here. Ortiz. Commissioner Ortiz here. Commissioner Rapashad. Here. A quorum is present. The first item is the approval of the minutes of the public meeting of Wednesday, September 16th, 2020. On the minutes, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any, anyone opposed? The minutes are approved. The next item is scheduling. Calendar numbers number one and two, we have resolutions for adoption for scheduling. Wednesday, October 21st, 2020, for a remote public hearing to be held through the NYC Engage portal. On the resolutions, all in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone, anyone opposed? The resolutions are adopted. The next part of the calendar is the report section on page four. Borough of Queens, calendar numbers three and four. CD4, calendar number three, C200103 ZMQ, calendar number four, N200104 ZRQ. In the matter of its applications for zoning map and zoning text amendments concerning 110 to 40 Sartell Avenue rezoning. For Fable reports on calendar numbers three and four. Vice Chairman Knuckles. Yes. Commissioner Bernie. Yes. Commissioner Capelli. Yes. Commissioner Cerullo. Yes. Commissioner De La Luz. Um, I just want to say that I, while I recognize the community board's concerns um, that they express about this project, that uh, I believe this development accommodates the much needed medical service um, and housing, including mandatory inclusionary housing for essential workers. <coughs> With that, I vote yes. Commissioner Dweck. Yes. Commissioner Eady. Yes. Commissioner Knight. Yes. Commissioner Levin. Uh, for the same reasons articulated by Commissioner De La Uz, I vote yes. Commissioner Marie. Yes. Commissioner Ortiz. Yes. Commissioner Rabashad. Yes. Fable reports have been adopted on calendars number three and four. Borough of Queens, number five, CD1, C. 200238 PCQ in the matter of an application for the site selection and acquisition of property concerning Department of Sanitation, Queens Sanitation Garage for a favorable report on calendar number five. Vice Chairman Knuckles. Yes. Commissioner Bernie. Uh, just with the caveat that we did encourage <clears throat> Department of Sanitation to do some minimal work on um, improving the waterfront access, but otherwise, yes. Commissioner Capelli. Uh, agreeing with Commissioner Bernie's comments, uh, I vote yes. Commissioner Cerullo. Yes. Commissioner De La Luz. I vote yes, and I'm excited that this use is being removed from a, a NYCHA property and uh, it's going into a 21st century uh, design property, so yes. Commissioner Dweck. Yes. Commissioner Eady. Yes. Commissioner Knight. Yes. Commissioner Levin. Yes. 
Commissioner Marie. Yes. Commissioner Ortiz. Yes. Commissioner Rapashad. Yes. A favorable report has been adopted on calendar number five. Calendar number six, Borough of Staten Island, CD2, N200355 ZCR, in the matter of an application for the grant of a certification concerning 272 and 280 Edinburgh. For adoption on calendar number six, Vice Chairman Knuckles. Yes. Commissioner Bernie. Yes. Commissioner Capelli. Yes. Commissioner Cerullo. Yes. Commissioner De La Hoos. Yes. Commissioner Dweck. Yes. Commissioner Eady. Yes. Commissioner Knight. Yes. Commissioner Levin. Yes. Commissioner Levin. Marie. Yes. Commissioner Ortiz. Yes. Commissioner Rabashan. Yes. A favorable report has been adopted on calendar number six. Borough of Staten Island, calendar number seven, CD3, N170263, RCR. <clears throat> In the matter of an application for the grant of certification concerning 120 Bayview Avenue for adoption on calendar number seven, Vice Chairman Knuckles. Yes. Commissioner Bernie. Yes. Commissioner Tapelli. Yes. Commissioner Cerullo. Yes. Commissioner De La Luz. Yes. Commissioner Dweck. Yes. Commissioner Eady. Yes. Commissioner Knight. Yes. Commissioner Levin. Yes. Commissioner Marine. Yes. Commissioner Ortiz. Yes. Commissioner Rapashad. Yes. A favorable report has been adopted on calendar number seven. The next part of the calendar is the public hearing, which begins on page eight. Our first item, Borough of Brooklyn, calendar numbers eight, nine, and 10. CD7, calendar number eight, C200. 092 ZMK, calendar number nine, N200093 ZRK, calendar number 10, C200094 ZSK. A public hearing in the matter of applications for zoning map and zoning text amendments and a special permit concerning 312 Coney Island Avenue rezoning. Again, uh, we ask those who are testifying to limit their remarks to three minutes, after which you will be muted. For those who wish to use consecutive ASL translation services that are available today, you will be limited to five minutes. Please also let me note that while we welcome the opportunity to hear your comments, we ask that courtesy and decorum be observed at all times during your testimony. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, please let each speaker or team of speakers know when their time begins. Yes, Mr. Vice Chair. Vice Chair, did you get the list of names uh, for the speakers that was sent to you? It should be in your, your email. Uh, give me a second. I don't have it. Okay, the applicant team uh, for 10 minutes. Um, 
consists of Zach Bernstein, Dan Kaplan, Morris Jerome, Ray uh, Kazis, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Toby Snyder, Wesley O'Brien, and Abigail Rudo. That's the applicant team for 10 minutes. And waiting for a clock. Unmute. Okay, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. May I begin? Please. Good. Good morning, Vice Chair Knuckles and Commissioners. I'm Zachary Bernstein with Freed Frank, Land Use Council for the Applicant. This is an application to facilitate redevelopment of 312 Coney Island Avenue with new church and school facilities for the International Baptist Church together with an MIH development providing approximately 70 new units of affordable housing. The applicant is an affiliate of JEMB Realty, which holds a ground lease under which it will serve as developer of the site. The property is owned by the International Baptist Church. Here with me is Morris Jerome, a principal of the applicant, as well as Ray Kazis, pastor of the church. I will give Morris and the pastor a moment to introduce themselves. Next slide, please. Good morning, Commissioner. I am Morris Jerome here on behalf of JEMB Realty. Uh, we are a family-owned, third-generation real estate company founded in 1980 by my grandfather, Morris Bailey. Our firm prides itself on long-term ownership and community engagement with all properties that we own and manage, some of which are shown on this slide. We have a track record of including community facilities in our building. One prominent example is in downtown Manhattan, we successfully opened the first post 9-11 high school known as Millennium High School at 75 Broad Street. Next slide, please. As a lifelong Brooklyn resident, I am proud that we are nearing the completion of our new office building in downtown Brooklyn known as One Willoughby Square. This project was a collaboration between the EDC and the School Construction Authority which is resulting in a new 300 seat public school for the area. Our design lead was Dan Kaplan for this project. He did an amazing job and we brought him on now to design this very important project on Caton Avenue. We've worked closely to date with city planning and the local council member to design a building at this prominent location that we should all be proud of. The project includes much needed affordable housing for the area, as well as a new chapel and school for the church. The pastor who is here now will tell you a little bit more about our goals that we are working towards together. Well, good morning, commissioners. Next, uh, next slide, please. Okay. Yeah, good morning, uh, commissioners. My name is Ray Kazis. I've been the pastor at the International Baptist Church since 2008 and I've raised my family here in the Windsor Terrace neighborhood. We are a Baptist congregation, and our church is a diverse community. It conducts uh, services in three languages. Our membership includes about 30 nationalities. Well, part of our, our ministry is a K-12 through school with 85 students. Uh, and a number of years ago, we started to plan for our future, and we're so glad that we found JEMB Realty, who will be ground leasing the property and giving us back a new and improved church and school. Uh, we like JMB. They share a vision of how a new development will be a positive addition to our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Next slide, please. Here's an image of a site located within the CA2 district along Coney Island Avenue. The CA2 is shown in gray outlined in blue in this slide. The applicant seeks the following actions. Zoning map amendment from CA2 to R8A with the C24 overlay. This allows a 7.2 FAR development, which will support both MIH and the new church and school facilities. A zoning text amendment to map an MIH area on the site. A zoning text amendment to the Special Ocean Parkway District to allow the street wall to rise without setback on the project's wide streets. And a special permit to waive residential accessory parking rules, allowing for a portion of the parking spaces to be utilized by the church on Sundays. Next slide, please. 
the only recent private development in the CA2 district has been hotel or self-storage uses. Let's face the reality of the context around this site. Here is a photo that I took last weekend, I live in the area, of the new Cube Smart building that now sits right next to our site, with most of its frontage on the narrow street of Caden Place. Oh, MIH, re next slide please. MIH rezonings have been largely in low income communities of color, and this is an opportunity to make the most of the program in an amenity rich, wealthier neighborhood. Median income in Windsor Terrace is near six figures. In the 2016 report adopting MIH zoning, the commission stated the following. Neighborhoods affect economic opportunity and quality of life by providing not just a location for housing, but a package of services and amenities for their residents. 312 Coney Island Avenue is a model of the type of site that is appropriate for increased density under MIH. As shown by the green park spaces occupying much of this slide and multicolor routes showing bus and bike lanes, the neighborhood is exceptionally rich in amenities. I heard questions on density raised at the review session. For this project, the R8A zoning is what supports the ability to provide new church and school facilities together with 70 or more permanently affordable apartments. These uses, church, school, affordable housing, occupy approximately 35% of this building's area. Reducing the density, as suggested by the community board, would reduce by more than 30 the number of families having access to affordable homes and the many amenities available at this location. This perpetuates the exclusivity of this area. Next slide, please. The proposal before you today, which is not what's on the slide, is the result of extensive dialogue with City Planning's Brooklyn office, together with Council Member Brad Lander. Here on the screen is our original proposal, which would have rebuilt only a portion of the site with greater height along the circle and leaving the existing school building in place. What you see here reflects 195 feet, which is what would be accomplished in the no action condition under the existing zoning controls. But with the encouragement of the council member and the department, we reached agreement to design a new school building replacing what you see in lavender on this screen. And it will be incorporated as part of a more contextual envelope across the whole site. I will now turn the presentation to Dan Kaplan of Epics Collaborative to discuss why the updated massing is right for this site. Next slide, please. Good morning, commissioners. Thank you, Zach. I'm Dan Kaplan of F FX Collaborative. Before taking you through the design, I want to point out that this is a rare site that fronts on three wide streets, ranging from 100 feet to nearly 500 feet wide, plus the park space beyond. The single narrow street is even wider than most at 70 uh, feet. Next slide, please. Th this slide illustrates two unique conditions of this development. One, the special district requires a 30 foot uh, front setback along Ocean Parkway. While a typical block is, is 200 feet deep, here we start with a narrower 180 feet deep. Second, incorporating over 40,000 square feet of church and school program, including a double height chapel, effectively lifts up the residential building. Further, residential amenities and other functions that might have been below grade are pushed up uh, above uh, as, the, as the school and church occupy the below grade as well. As most of you are well aware, incorporating these uses into the residential base substantially increases the cost and complexity of, of development. Next slide, please. Um, when we mass the residential floors above at the request of the council member, we sought to create the, a transition area from the adjacent R7A district. Illustrated here in lighter yellow is where the bulk from the western portions of the site has been shifted to the full street wall along the circle. The result is a strong architectural presence that frames the circle consistent with the other park circles like Grand Army Plaza. I'll show you that in a moment. I recognize that there were various questions about the height on this project. We have already designed with this in mind, incorporating a four-story transition towards the center of the block. However, at the confluence of three extra wide streets, I suggest this is precisely where this height and this massing makes sense. Next slide, please. Taking a cue from the historic uh, fabric of the area, we propose vertical notches to break up the larger form. Next slide. I now have six renderings to show you, which I will go through quickly. This aerial shows the building's presence on the circle. Next slide. Now looking from park circle, we show how the street wall frames the large open area. Next slide. 
Here is a pedestrian view of the park circle frontage in response to the request from Monday's review session. It shows the church and school use on the lower two floors occupying the entire circle frontage. This church, the church facility is integrated into the rest of the building and is not a separate or standalone identity or element. Next slide, please. This view is from Ocean Parkway. It shows the transition from the R7A district on the right and the use of the notches to break down the scale. Next slide. This is a view on Caton Place uh, showing the transition in three steps up from 57 Caton. Next slide. The idea of a clear, simple form rising directly from grade to cornice without setback is consistent with the well-loved and other park circles of Prospect Park. Here are some along Grand Army Plaza. They create a strong spatial definition of the circle and a clear demarcation between park and urban fabric. Next slide, please. Finally, uh, just two plans. Uh, here's our concept for the ground floor plan that organizes the multiple programs. Uh, in, in purple, the main entrance to the church and school is directly on Park Circle with the wide sidewalk. The main residential entrance shown in yellow is on Ocean Parkway. And the service and parking entrances are located on Caton Place as well as the neighborhood oriented retail use. Fine. There will be a, yeah. Mm -hmm. are available for questions. Okay, you, com you have uh, completed your presentation? Well, we have just two more, just really the end of this slide and uh, the, the seller slide and that would be it. Okay, really have, have the 10 minutes run? Uh, yes, Mr. Vice Chair. All righty, thank you. Uh, are there any questions from the commission? Uh, Commissioner Bernie uh, to be followed by Commissioner Dweck and then Commissioner Rompershod. Commissioner Bernie. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dan, Mr. Kaplan, could you just show the last two slides that you were hoping to show? Yes, yes, happy to. Thank you, thank you Commissioner. Uh, if you could pull those up, yes. Uh, I believe it, it's slide 19, yes, thank you. Uh, so uh, the residential, so I just was going around uh, the, um, would you like me to finish the description or we, did you have a question? No, I'd like you to answer the question. Yeah, the, finish the, yeah, just okay. explain the two slides would be helpful. Okay, thank you. So um, uh, the community, the, the church and school take up uh, park circle frontage uh, uh, and wrap around uh, the corners. They're shown in purple. The residential is in yellow with its main entrance on Ocean Parkway and a secondary entrance on Caton Place. Along Caton Place is a uh, resident uh, as a um, neighborhood oriented tail space, bike parking, and the uh, parking garage below, uh, ramp to uh, access the below grade parking. If you go to the next slide, uh, I, I would li also like to mention there's 140 bike parking spaces on, on the ground floor. The below grade seller plan, we were able to fit approximately 80 spaces. 36 of these spaces would be available to church congregants on Sunday to replace the existing surface parking on the site. Otherwise, the seller is taken up with um, more of the, the school and church and residential services. And Thank I think you. That, that concludes our slides. Thank you, Dave. Uh, did that, is that your questioning, uh, Commissioner? Uh, yes, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Dweck. Thank you. A um, couple of questions. I'm looking at the borough president's recommendations in his report and going back, I know you just touched on the parking. Will the congregate spaces be available to the community during the week when the church is not in service? Yes, they will. This is Zach. Okay, thank you. And another question, going back to the height, I noted that he had two uh, recommendations about the uh, zoning one would be an R8A with a step down to an R7A uh, that's connected to 57 K in place. And the other one would be a, a R7X district. I can certainly see the R8A on the um, circle side. Uh, I think that the concern of transitioning it to 57 K in place with the height that you have pro pro um, proposed right now at 105 feet 
is is a valid concern of the borough president. Would you would you be amenable to moving uh, the fifty seven moving the K in place to pass one hundred feet on Cone Island Avenue to uh, to an R seven A in line with the borough president's recommendation? And if it was an R eight A, would you agree to height restrictions on the transition uh, less than the one hundred and five foot proposed? So, so I'll, this is Zach again. I'll take that. Um, so if the if the concern that is being raised um, is with respect to the context and the height, um, I, we're, we're willing to engage in a conversation about what type of massing makes, makes sense. Um, we, we believe that this massing is sensitive in the way that it steps up, but there's certainly opportunity for conversation there. Changing the zoning district to a lower density district, a lower FAR, both calls into question the applicant's ability to rebuild the, the school building and the church uh, as we worked out with the council member in the department and also reduces the number of permanent affordable housing units. So, so I think that the main concern um, obviously was the transitional height and then the overall height. Uh, I know that it is less than 195 and you can have uh, um, with a no action. But um, so what, how many units would you lose or what ability would you lose by moving to an R7A on, on the past 100 feet on Coney Island Avenue? Uh, well, I mean, moving to R7A across the, the site. Uh, not across the site. Yeah. Not across the site. Uh, I'm talking about the, the 100 feet past Coney Island, uh, down Coney Island Avenue, connected to the, to the Caton Place site. Yeah, I mean, I don't, have, I don't have the calculation offhand about precisely how much area that would involve, but um, you know, it's, it's losing a, a substantial amount of FAR. So I would say you know, 10 or more units of affordable housing, you know, certainly de depending, give or take, depending on how it's mapped. If, if you could follow up with us and get us a, a rendering, if possible, with the proposed um, zoning being an R8A and a split zoning of an R8A and R7A, according to the borough president's recommendation, that would be helpful in understanding um, what, what we're looking at. Okay. Yeah, I, I would say that we would prefer to focus on a follow-up that addresses specific height-related transition concerns rather than reducing affordable housing and, um, and, and having to go back and relook at the way the project's been put together as far as incorporating the school building into here, which was at, at great expense and complexity. I, I think that the, the urban design exercise is a more useful one to the success of the project. So then perhaps get us uh, um, a rendering of what that would look like with, with the height uh, connect on, this, on the spot connected to 57K in place coming in at a maximum of 95 feet in line with mm -hmm. the R7A. Okay. We can do that. Thank you. Okay, um, Commissioner Ortiz, and just let me check, uh, Commissioner Marine, did you have a question as well? No, I'm, I'm not yet. Okay, good. Uh, Commissioner Ortiz. Hello, um, so I, um, I asked some questions during review session um, regarding the uh, ground floor commercial space on Caton. Um, I was curious, you know, what kinds of uses um, do you envision in that location? Thank you. And we, we heard the comment um, and did sort of look back at it and think about uh, potential evolutions. I know you're also asking about its location at a bit of a remove from the, the corner. So I, I think both Dan Kapp and the architect can very briefly address that point and, and maybe Morris can speak from the applicant can speak to uh, potential types of retail that could be successful here. Yes, yeah. so this is Dan Kaplan. So um, uh, in the review session, it was noted that um, perhaps uh, relocating it to the corner with greater visibility would make sure that it wasn't a um, orphaned um, retail space. Uh, this is something we can certainly look into and uh, in some of our um, further development of, uh, uh, of this uh, project uh, we have considered and uh, certainly something uh, that makes some sense. So uh, in terms of the uses, I mean, it's, it's a small space, um, maximum 5,000 feet. Um, we imagine that to be community oriented retail space that really services the, um, the residential, um, uh, you know, the, the residents in the, in the neighborhood and, and who are living upstairs. 
Yeah, I, I will add, and I appreciate that, that, you know, 5,000 square feet of neighborhood serving retail is, is quite a lot to fill if it's not connected to, you know, other kinds of retail. So I have some concerns. I, I think it's better if it's more visible. I, I, Kayton, um, you know, I think it's really interesting, every historic precedent that you shared, um, you know, the buildings are beautiful and none of them have ground floor retail. Um, Caton Place also, if you walk down the street, um, you know, the following block, um, it's a lovely residential street with no ground floor retail. Um, you know, I don't think retail wants to be at that location. Um, and so I, I appreciate you sort of thinking about that. I, I wouldn't be in support of, of retail along Caton. I would just say we, we heard in the process and from the community, this area is kind of starved for neighborhood retail. There's a, there's a very, very small food co-op um, in the area, the Windsor Terrace Food Co-op, but there's really very, very little here. And we heard calls that there would be an interest in having some neighborhood services here. So it's a, it's a C24 overlay. It's not required to have retail, but we do think that there, something here can be a benefit to the neighborhood. Yeah, then it makes sense on a more visible, uh, at a more visible location. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Rompershot. Yes, uh, thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, my question is really pertain to the school. Can you, because I don't see a floor plan here, can you clarify the exact square footage that's allocated for the school? How many seats? And will they have access to any outdoor area within the uh, for the building? Uh, Dan, would you like to speak to that? Sure, absolutely. So um, the total uh, gross square footage, not the zoning square. The total gross square footage of, of the of the school and church is is about um, forty two thousand five hundred, of which almost thirty thousand is the school. Um, the main entrance is on Park Circle. The school goes up one floor, and on the second floor, lining Park Circle and Caton Place, are classrooms. Um, there is also an outdoor play area on uh, the terrace on the second floor for, for the students. And then uh, below uh, at grade and below grade, there's a two story high um, dimitorium, as we call them. Uh, and, uh, you know, for, for the students for recreational uh, use. And how many students are you projecting? Or have you, your discussions with DOE, have you? determine how many students? So this is a facility, uh, this is a church-based school. Um, church -based, and and yeah. so I think it's been designed for approximately 100 students. Dan, maybe, maybe more? Yes, maybe, it's, it's more um, uh, Toby Snyder, who's been laying out the school. Toby, can you, can you help me with the number of, 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 of classroom seats, please? Um, we're looking at, at approximately uh, 150 to 180 seats, actually. So it is, it is a, an expansion of what is currently, um, what, the, what the current facility is using. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Uh, com uh, Commissioner, uh, have you concluded, uh, Commissioner yes. Rampachar? Thank yes, you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Commissioner De La Luz. Hi. I, I wanted to um, first, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, Commissioner Dweck asked uh, many of the questions uh, about the height that the community board also expressed concern about. And I just wanted to turn to some of the other concerns that the community board laid out, um, in, in, including traffic concerns, local public school overcrowding concerns, infrastructure concerns, and, um, you know, not not the least of which equestrian safety, um, in addition to pedestrian safety. I'm wondering if the development team can um, talk through, uh, you know, how the development may be impacting those things and any ideas for mitigation or conversations that you've had with various agencies about it. Sure, so this is Zach again, and, and uh, my colleague Wesley O'Brien with Freed Frank is here and can speak to the details of, of some of this. Um, the, the EAS looked at all of these areas that the community board raised with respect to public schools, there is capacity within the local subdistricts. Um, and, and I would point out that there are two beautiful new schools uh, serving pre-K elementary and middle um, within very close proximity to this site, um, who I think would love to have some, some of the additional students that are being brought in. Um, and we can speak more directly to that. Um, you know, infrastructure, the EAS did not find any uh, adverse impact on 
um, area infrastructure. And if there are any particular areas we, you'd like us to, to speak about, I, I can ask Wesley to, to do so. Um, and we're sensitive to equestrian safety issues and also um, issues with traffic around the circle. I know even since the community board's recommendation, DOT has been actively looking at the area and they've proposed a new protected mm -hmm. bike route um, along Parkside Avenue across from the site with I think some minor rearrangements of flows around the circle. We have not had direct engagement with the relevant agencies around these things, but certainly would be willing to as the project advances and also you know, we, we've been in touch with the stables and to continue to coordinate to make sure you know, both during construction and when the building's operational that we take account of the equestrian pathways um, uh, around and across the site. But one thing the community board asked about was um, you know follow-up traffic study um, and uh, I'm wondering how the development team what the development team thinks about that. I, I mean I, I you know, we, we screened out of, of um, traffic analysis by uh, a, a long shot. Um, I, I'm not sure, you know, a loosely defined traffic, I'm not sure what that traffic study would be, but if there are specific concerns about operations there, you know, it, it's a highly trafficked area. This circle leads to um, Ocean Parkway and, and the on, you know, near the on-ramp to the Prospect Expressway, a, a lot of transient traffic comes comes through here. Um, part of what we're trying to do is not add more cars to this site with the request for the parking waiver, not invite people to have individual cars that they're bringing here. Um, but uh, so, so we would be happy to work with DOT and the community on specific issues that are identified. I, I don't know that a loosely defined traffic study is, is, is necessary. I mean, we're, we just weren't entirely sure what that means. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Um, the the one thing I would say, especially assuming this gets approved, that during construction, I'm I'm just wondering for all the reasons you just said about the heavily trafficked area. I mean, are are you all thinking that uh, you're going to be doing staging on Caton? Is is that is that the thought? That's a great question. I don't I don't know the answer. I don't know if Morris knows at this point. I, I'm not sure we're there yet on a on a um, site safety plan and construction staging, but we it's in everybody's interest to have it where there's the least impact. And we, we certainly take suggestions and work with um, the, the community and the city to do that in the way that's the least disruptive possible. Okay. Um, and then, you know, one last question, you know, the community board recommended um, different MIH options than, than what you all are recommending. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, you know, personally, I, I would love deeper affordability, but at 25% uh, of the total, uh, you know, square footage. Um, and, but uh, has, has that been discussed further with the local council person? Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, we've, I mean, we've discussed the MAH option with the local council person and his preference has been for option one, um, the 25% at the average of 60%. Um, and that's what we've run our models to have a development that works. Um, you know, could there be opportunities to, uh, uh, you know, work flexibly within that? There could, but we think it makes sense to map option one here. And we think that's what the council member will, will prefer when this gets to the council as well. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Levin. Yes, thank you. Um, I want to compliment the applicant team on um, mastering our remote format here with a really crisp, clear, straightforward, um, and effective presentation. I think we're getting the kinks worked out of this and you're showing the way to how to use 10 minutes very effectively. Um, I also wanted to thank you, um, Dan and your team, for the um, close-ups of the ground floor um, situation, particularly on the circle. Um, certainly all of the concerns I uh, expressed on Monday um, are uh, relieved by those or allayed by um, that um, image. Um, and I think I um, also uh, found your um, discussion of the density um, uh, pretty effective. So I'm going to rethink the comments that I had on Monday as well. Um, the community board raised concerns about um, uh, design principles, um, uh, 
requesting a commitment for universal inclusive design, which I know you know a lot about, as well as sustainable design practices. I wonder if you could um, tell us a little bit about how those features will be incorporated or the extent to which those features will be incorporated into this building. Okay, uh, th thank you, Commissioner Levin. So um, le let me start uh, sustainability um, side of things. Uh, uh, we're committed to um, a lead building. Um, we're currently targeting silver and looking at our options. Um, I think the biggest thing we can do with this building from a sustainability point of view is make sure that we are doing a very responsible envelope. Um, we are currently tracking about um, one third window to two thirds opaque approximately, which is a very good ratio and that's gonna save energy uh, over the long haul. And we are also um, considering um, utilizing the zone green um, uh, route, which basically um, makes for a much more um, effective exterior wall that, that borders on uh, passive house principles. So the, the, the insulation of the exterior wall is, is very good. Of course, there'll be a lot of green roofs. We have a lot of site greenery here, healthy materials. Um, interestingly, um, because of the of the church and, and, and school layout, we have two residential cores um, with access to daylight. And what that does is subdivide the population. So for our recent pandemic uh, <laughs> that we're living through, this is a good practice because it subdivides the population and and makes for you know dual cores, more elevators, more stairs, and so forth. Um, we, so, um, last thing on on the site uh, on the sustainability, as was noted before, um, with with the horses and with the the uh, right next to the park, uh, uh, and the uh, site treatment along the circle, and increasing the number of street trees, and we are looking into. Um, uh, the, the rain garden, um, a bioswale type uh, street trees uh, so that we can control runoff uh, uh, for uh, both the, both the um, safety of the, of the horses and also for, for the um, quality of the rivers. In terms of, finally, in terms of the um, uh, universal design, this will be, of course, uh, ADA and FHA compliant and a portion of the um, uh, uh, MIH units will be uh, what's called UFAS, uh, which is um, day one, uh, you know, co completely uh, uh, accessible um, and uh, not only adaptable. So uh, absolutely uh, universal design um, and uh, uh, complying with all of the, the standards. Okay, thank you. And before I turn my mic off here, I just wanted to thank you, Dan, for your um, recent op-ed. Um, on the subject of uh, Euler. I think there's some complicated issues to think through and I'm glad you're part of the discussion. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's an, a very interesting moment we're all living through and hopefully we can grab the good parts of it. <laughs> For sure. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further questions for the applicant team from the commission? If not, we will now uh, proceed with our procedure of five speakers in opposition, followed by five speakers in support. Um, and we will go back and forth until the speaker list is exhausted. So we'll start with those speakers in opposition, starting with Mark Duffin, uh, who will be followed by Mr. Todd Weeks. And each speaker, of course, has three minutes. Mark Duffin. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. OK. Um, thank you for um, taking the time to hear me. I just, with three minutes, want to hit a bunch of things real quickly. Um, I agree that we should develop this area, but I utterly disagree with this particular development. I feel it's entirely too large, entirely out of scope with the neighborhood. And I would like to bring to your attention that not only did the CB7 say that it was inappropriate in size, the, R8, the proposed R8A 
zoning, but also the borough president agreed that the proposed R8A zoning was out of scale to the neighborhood. Um, I have written in saying, voicing my opposition to the met methodology of the developer's EAS uh, statements. I feel that they have cherry picked data and presented it in such a way that justifies all of their points and as a 20 year resident of this neighborhood, pretty much ignores all of my concerns. Um, so I would encourage you folks to take another look through that. Um, I would simply say that this is without precedent, this, um, the size and scope of this. I know that they have put forth a very beautiful presentation um, showing these beautiful buildings in Grand Army Plaza. I would like to just bring to your attention what's been omitted. What's been omitted is Grand Army Plaza is 15 acres as opposed to our five acres. Grand Army Plaza, all of those beautiful buildings are separated from the, the circle proper by raised earthen berms that are covered with forest. So the sound and visual distancing happens. I would also like to note that they omitted one Grand Army Plaza, the newest construction building there, which is also 15 stories, but has the setbacks and has three levels with roughly 200 public parking spaces beneath it. Obviously, they don't want uh, us to believe that that's possible, but it clearly is. Um, I would note also that they um, ironically used 30 Ocean Parkway as an example of um, style of building to look at, but in their EAS, they've happily said that 30 Ocean Parkway is too far um, away from their pro projected building um, to be considered in terms of height. Finally, I would suggest that um, perhaps there's a third option and that we should use the R7X zoning, but simply disallow the R7X height and suggest the 95 foot height restriction. Um, I know that they say it's unaffordable, but I would prefer to protect the neighborhood instead of the profits of the developer and the church. Um, thank you for my, your time. I appreciate your listening. I do not support the project as it is currently represented. Thank you, Mr. Duffin. Uh, right on time. Uh, are there any questions for Mr. Duffin? Thank you, sir. Uh, I do have a question. I'm so, okay. Sorry, not question Commissioner De La Luz. Hi, Mr. Duffin, thanks for being here. It's, it's interesting that you raised the, um, the project on Grand Army Plaza, I'm forgetting right now, the architect who designed it, um, that has 200 parking spaces. I, I, don't, I don't believe that has affordable housing or a church or a school. Is that, does it have any, or retail actually, does it have any of the other things that this project is proposing to your knowledge? Uh, to my knowledge, no. I, I don't know those answers, and I appreciate that they want to have the church and those elements, the retail elements, but I still feel that the massive size of this building is utterly inappropriate to the small size of our neighborhood and the height of the buildings in the neighborhood, regardless of all of the other benefits which are here. I agree that a new church would be beautiful. I agree that retail could be beneficial. However, I was simply citing the other building in terms of what isn't being shown because ultimately that entire area at Grand Army Plaza is three times the size of our area and you're trying to pluck a building that would be very appropriate in Grand Army Plaza and stick it into our small neighborhood and I think it's inappropriate and I think that the community board and the borough president have agreed with me on that point. Thank you. Commissioner Levin, did you have a question? I did, but in the course of his answer, um, Mr. Duffin just took care of my issue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any further questions for Mr. Duffin? All right, our next speaker is uh, Mr. Todd Weeks who will be followed by a uh, Miss Basidian, Triachia Basidian. Mr. Weeks, please. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, again, my name is Todd Weeks. I live at 30 Ocean Parkway. 
uh, which is the building that Mr. Duffin just mentioned, and I am speaking against this development. Um, I have also, I've lived in Windsor Terrace for 20 years. So um, good morning, uh, Vice Chair Nichols and commissioners. Um, we are living in an increasingly data-driven world. Those who control the data tend to control the conversation. I'd ask you for a minute to think outside the data and outside the conversation that is controlled by the data. I think what many of us who've lived in this community enjoy is a feeling that we have secured a little bit of peace of mind, a respectable middle-class peace of mind. And many of us did not start out that way. We came to New York on our own. We found survival jobs. We met our partners. We moved into bigger spaces. We struggled, but we stayed. We contributed to the local economy. We paid our taxes. We joined PTAs. We voted here. We raised our families here. We love our community. And yet we see now that changes are afoot in our community and that the data-driven conversation suggests that this is all fait accompli. And we scratch our heads and we say, wait a minute, this doesn't feel right. Now we've heard from our elected officials, such as Council Member Lander, that the ULERP is broken. We've heard from our elected officials that we need to stand aside and allow for the development of Brooklyn because this is inevitable. The word renaissance is used, but I would say renaissance for whom? For those who can afford it. We've heard from our elected officials that they have a mandate to create more affordable housing, which we agree with. But nowhere do we hear from our elected officials that there is something highly unethical and just plain wrong about a developer who threatens to build an 18-story hotel as of right unless we in the neighborhood bow to their 13-story compromise. Well, the CPC and the borough president and the council member and the mayor should consider that we put our elected officials and their appointees in positions of power based on their promises that they'd advocate for us. The majority of people who live around Machadi Circle and who use the Fort Hamilton Parkway subway station and the local buses and roadways and the bike lanes and the parking spaces, the majority of the people that we have spoken to are adamantly opposed to this 13-story building on this site. Uh, I'd just like to close by saying that the conversations that will be eventually happening on the subway platform, which is already tremendously overcrowded, and this project will most likely add another 400 people to that platform. Those conversations, we can actually have impact on them. If you scale this building down to R7A or some combination that brings it down in scope and reduces the density, you reduce the, the uh, crowds on that subway platform. And the conversations on that platform will be about what the City Planning Commission and our elected officials did that was right. And I ask you to make that choice. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weeks. Questions for Mr. Weeks? No questions. Uh, our next speaker is Ms. Basidian. Ms. Basidian? Yes. yes. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Tricia Bastian, and um, I have lived at 30 Ocean Parkway in Windsor Terrace back when people used to joke about um, they used to roll up the sidewalks at, um, at night. Um, first of all, I just want to just, I want to say that I'm actually went into a panic when I saw the proposed uh, photo of what they, what they proposed there. That is the design is not even suitable for a downtown business location considering 21st century, uh, the changes that we have. That looks like something that could be a uh, Columbus Circle. This, it's a shiny blight. Um, there's no regard for updated hurricane codes. They threw out some things about stormwater re remediation. There is no room. Um, I'm a master composter of the sanitation department and I'm also a citizen tree pruner. I've been watching the trees die in this neighborhood um, be because of the, we don't have permeable pavement. There are puddles that last for weeks right around that circle. Um, there's no room for social distancing. There's no room for, um, for, for to put the garbage and recycling out. I mean, this is a lovely corner and they're trying to literally block it. And my most important thing that I put out to everyone there is I want a CRTN study, which is a calculation of road and traffic noise. This morning I was up very early and I was looking at people in China and people in Greece that were talking about every, every city has a need. We do need to, more housing, we need more housing. And we have Windsor Terrace, everyone I know that has six figures, they're moving out of the neighborhood. This is, there's no amenities here. The only amenity here is the park. We are in a food desert. Um, the neighborhood had to, had to go to war with Walgreens in order to have a small 
grocery store put in. There are three lovely old growth trees there, a beautiful beech tree and an oak tree that remediate noise. The noise is untenable. I know a woman who is working on her PhD. She works, she works for CUNY. She's a, a professor. At, at, and she has to, had to leave in order to finish, to finish her, her thesis. She has a, a rescue dog from our local rescue people who, who cannot go outside because of the traffic. Uh, the, the gas company has been outside of our building for years now trying to fix a leak because of the increased uh, illegal truck traffic on our road. This neighborhood was already steamrolled by Robert Moses when he put in the Prospect Expressway and now it's recovering and for the first time becoming a real community. In the last year, people with families have moved in here. There weren't people with families here before. Those two new schools are crowded. What we need is thoughtful design. We need beautiful design. We need design that is in keeping with the neighborhood. We need design that people can afford because what you're calling affordable housing, I don't personally know very many people that can afford that. I want people to have a quality of life, people that live in the building and people have to look at the building and be affected by the noise of the building. I would like you to reconsider the R7, uh, R7A uh, zoning because this is just be pushing their beliefs of profit over people and it is profit over people. Thank you, Ms. Thank Bastian. You. Uh, sorry for the mispronunciation. Uh, questions from Sebastian. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jeannie Hutchins. Jeannie Hutchins. Jeannie Hutchins. Uh, Mr. Vice Chair, I do not see her in the room right now. Okay. So we'll proceed with John Semino, and perhaps she'll reappear. John Semino. Mr. Semino. He is in the room and should be able to unmute his mic. Thank you. Mr. Semino, you should be able to begin your testimony now. Mr. Semino, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yep. now, please proceed. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, good morning, commissioners and all else. I am a lifelong Brooklynite living in Brooklyn for 60 years now. I grew up on that block, 46 Caton Place. I have applied, I'm a transit worker making good, good city money. I've applied for the four new buildings that were built there in the last decade, 22 Caton Place, 31 Caton Place, um, the one on Cornell Avenue, which, uh, which is a half a block away from the proposal. Uh, none of them I can afford as a city worker, okay? so. The affordability of this project doesn't address the neighborhood or Brooklyn as a whole. Affordability is, is my main concern. And the education of our public schools in the area. At least four public schools are within three blocks of that that's proposal. Three of them public, one of them charter. All of them overcrowded. This doesn't address any of that. Um, don't be um, deluded because there is a school, a proposed school for the church inside the building. That is for the church to, um, to accommodate the church uh, congregants. It's not accommodating the public school children in the neighborhood or even the Catholic school children in the neighborhood, um, which have all been there for decades. Uh, affordability. Uh, if I grew up on the block and can't afford any of the the already 265 units built uh, on that block. And now you're proposing another, uh, I believe 75 or so, bringing it up to th about 350 unaffordable uh, prices for any, any of those teachers in those schools, any city worker in the neighborhood, anyone in the neighborhood could afford, then you're displacing all the, all the neighbors, very slowly, but very surely. Um, 
that is, and to propose another one on top of the already uh, blighted area with luxury housing, to propose that is not only an insult, but it's, uh, it'll, it'll devastate the neighborhood. Proposals without any community input are again a travesty to and an insult to, the, to all the neighbors. No community, the community input we had, and the community board is not even being listened to. The community board we had a, a, a meeting, and the community board proposals are, are obviously being ignored. Okay, um, so this this proposal needs community input by the real community at meetings that the community calls in the neighborhood and let that let people have the input. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not opposed. Thank, thank you, Mr. Cimino. Uh, questions for Mr. Cimino? Questions for Mr. Cimino? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, did uh, Ms. Hutchins uh, re return? Brian, before we go for the... Uh, uh, no, she is not yet in the room. She's not okay. in the room. We will now move to speakers in favor, uh, starting with Mr. John Bennett, who will be followed by Ms. Cassandra uh, Carillo. John Bennett. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning, members of the City Planning uh, Commission. My name is John Bennett, and I've lived in the Windsor Terrace area since I was in fifth grade some 55 years ago. I support this rezoning proposal for a number of reasons, and, and quickly here are a few. The property is in a unique location being on the circle. It is a large property. It's a location that makes it a gateway to the Kensington neighborhood from, and the, from the park and uh, Windsor Terrace. The proposed building is classy, it's good looking, and will help hide the results of rejecting a zoning change on the other side of Caton Place, where a relatively ugly self-storage building has been built as right. Uh, many things could be built on this pr property as right with the current zoning, most of them not pretty. Uh, one that may look good would be a hotel but this would be more for the benefit of people outside the community than those in the community. The community for the most part is a residential community. So an apartment complex or building makes the most sense here. The proposed configuration allows for a high number of affordable units. And this number would be greatly reduced if a building of less height were built. In addition, uh, the uh, increased number of residents would be a boost to local businesses, and the local businesses can certainly use that now. And finally, the property currently uh, has a church and school on it and is not on the uh, city tax rolls for property taxes. I can only imagine what the uh, property taxes uh, paid each year to the city would be if the proposed configuration is allowed. For these and many other reasons, I would encourage the Planning Commission to approve this zoning change. Uh, I thank the Commission for their time. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Questions? Commissioner De La Uz. First, I just want to thank Mr. Bennett for coming. I, it's, it's been a while since we've uh, heard about property taxes uh, as a reason to approve something. I, I think it's definitely a sign of the times that we're in. So I, I yeah, appreciate him coming to remind us of that. We, we are in unusual times. Further questions for Mr. Bennett? Thank you. Uh, our next uh, speaker, will uh, utilize a uh, translator. Uh, that would be Ms. Carillo. Ms. Carillo, please speak. We need audio. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? I don't need a translator. Um, oh, I'm sorry. It came on the screen. 
Okay. Uh, please proceed. I can go ahead and start then. Okay. Yes, please. Uh, good, uh, good morning, Vice Chair Knuckles and members of the Commission. My name is Chassie Carrillo, and I'm a representative of 32BJ. I'm okay. here today on behalf of my union and more than 1,132 BJ members who live or work in Community District 7 to share our support for this project. 32 BJ supports responsible development, development that takes into consideration workers and working families. We believe that projects like this should come with credible commitments to prevailing wage jobs for building service workers and local hire. I'm pleased to announce that the developers for this project have made a credible commitment to provide prevailing wage building service jobs at this site. We estimate that this development will bring about 10 building service jobs to the neighborhood, and these jobs will be good jobs that pay family sustaining wages for local workers. For these reasons, we respectfully urge you to approve this project. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? For Ms. Carillo. Thank you. Uh, Ronald Longhofer. Ronald Longhofer. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great. Okay. Yes, my name is Ronald Longhofer, and I've lived in Brooklyn for 31 years, 25 of those in Windsor Terrace. Uh, not far from this proposed project. And uh, I do support the rezoning. Uh, the the uh, storage facility behind this proposed development has been mentioned before. Um, as storage buildings go, it might be attractive. I find it very unsightly. It's very visible from the circle. I traveled down Prospect Park Southwest this week and I saw uh, that building it's just it's nice we're really coming down that that road there uh that building does not fit this neighborhood uh, i very much am for a building that would mask that from the circle from the park uh, i do like the design to this new building as well i think that the uh it, it's an attractive building that accomplishes a lot of different purposes uh, it does provide for uh, renewed uh, uh properties for the church and school to upgrade their facilities and then it provides, of course, for the affordable housing. Uh, I understand that affordable can be defined a lot of different ways, but in New York City context, in Brooklyn context, uh, the, the numbers that were given at the meeting with the borough president uh, were very affordable. Uh, and then, you know, this is a, this is a high uh, income area as well. So even those units that are not considered affordable, I think a number of people in the area would find them very affordable as well. Um, so I am for the project, and I think that uh, it'd be a great thing for our city, for our neighborhood, uh, to, to build this project and to improve really the, the, the visibility there of Windsor Terrace to those who pass through. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, questions for Mr. Longhofer? Questions? Thank you. Our next speaker is Diane Atwood who will be then followed by Mrs. Jessica Park. Diane Atwood. Hi, uh, good morning. Um, my name is Diane Atwood. And, uh, the International Christian School. One, one moment, one moment, Ms. Atwood. I, I think we got some feedback. Somebody needs to mute. Uh, Ms. Atwood, are you uh, streaming the, the hearing? Um, yes, I, I am. am. Yeah, if you can mute the stream, that will that will uh, make it so we can hear you. Um, Oops, she muted herself. Ms. Edward, you can un unmute yourself in the in the Zoom. There okay, can you, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, hi. Good morning. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, commissioners. Um, well, my name is Diane Atwood. Uh, my children attend the International Christian School, so I'll speak on behalf of as a parent. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Oh, hi. 
teachers at ICS are fantastic and my kids love it there. It gives me a peace of mind that my kids are happy and enjoy learning at the International Christian School. And I'm, I'm in favor for the project because it will offer more opportunities for the kids that attend there and other facilities as well as upgraded classrooms. Go ahead, Ms. Atwood. Okay. I'm, I'm hearing an echo, that's why. And it yeah. was at the new affordable housing, which we need in New York City and across the country. Um, country. So I think it's really nice for us to work together to provide these opportunities for the kids. And And it will add new jobs for teachers. In the community and children in the community. I'm sorry about that, Miss Atwood. If you could just proceed with your 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 remarks. Oh, I'm finished. Thank you. Oh, oh okay. Thank you. Um, questions for Miss Atwood? Thank you, Ms. Atwood. Thank you for your testimony. Our next uh, speaker is uh, Mrs. Jessica Park. Jessica Park. Mrs. Jessica Park. Ryan, do we uh, have any uh, No, Ms. Park is not in the, uh, in the meeting right now. Okay, then we will uh, go back to speakers in opposition, uh, of which there appears to be one, uh, which means we're at the, uh, near the end of the public hearing on this matter. So let me just say if uh, any speakers have not registered, uh, but have decided during the course of this hearing that you would like to speak, now is the time to register. Again, you can find instructions on how to register, whether online or via phone, at www.nyc.gov slash NYC, capital E, engage. That's www.nyc.gov slash NYC, engage. And just so so you know, uh, Vice Chair, there is a an email that was sent with a, a handful of more speakers. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I believe it's. Um, just give me a second, um, Mr. Vieira. Serigo Vieira is our next speaker. Hello. You hear me? Yes. Okay, hello, good morning. Uh, thank you for giving me the floor. Um, so I just like to join the, my neighbors who essentially spoke in favor of some kind of development, but against this specific one. Um, they already spoke about the issue of scope and some environmental issues. And I would like to focus now more on the social economic impact. Uh, as we know, this, uh, according to the environmental assessment statement this building will bring 278 units we are talking about 872 uh, new residents which is about 5.1 percent increase in population in a surrounding distance of a quarter of a mile which is usually what you use to assess the impact on gentrification or uh, displacement. 
So that is a huge increase in the population. And by having 25% of affordable housing, that will not at all minimize the impact, impact of displacement. And we already have seen that in several parts of Brooklyn, uh, this idea that more construction will bring more middle income families, that is not the case. And that is also why the industry city uh, project was not approved, um, despite uh, affordable housing uh, included. And we have to also take into consideration that this impact will be complemented by other buildings that are uh, being uh, projected for the, the that same area. There is one, for instance, on 57 Caden Place, which will bring again 300 more residents. So essentially, the, the bigger or the, the, the size of the building, the stronger the impact will be on displacement. And so I don't understand when some of other speakers have mentioned that this will benefit the community. This will not benefit the community. This will benefit outsiders who have higher incomes that can afford this luxury and classy uh, apartments. Uh, so that's my main concern. So I do think that to be, to minimize the impact, you should either have a much higher percentage of affordable housing or minimize the size of the, the, the project, the development. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Are questions for Mr. Vieira? I mean, Commissioner De La Uz. Mr. Vieira, th thanks for coming and, and thanks for raising the concerns about about displacement. Um, I, I guess two, two questions, right? One is, it's, it's my understanding that the racial makeup in Windsor Terrace currently is over 60% white. Um, and I don't, I don't know of how many other MIH projects have happened in the community uh, offhand. I think the, the number is probably pretty limited. Um, so I'm just wondering uh, if you want to comment about that and then the, the community board's recommendation um, was about uh, trying to um, improve upon the MIH uh, that that is currently proposed and I'm, I'm wondering um, what what you think of that so sorry for, I, I didn't understand exactly the first question but I will answer the second and and if you, you can ask again the, the first question so for the second question uh, yes, that's so. If we increase the percentage of MIH, then we kind of limit the impact on displacement, but that will not solve the, all the environmental and the out of scope of the size of the building, which are the other part of the concerns. But that will definitely minimize the displacement of this specific development. Um, but your first question was about, I think, other buildings being uh, developed in the area. It was really two. One is that it's my understanding that Windsor Terrace is majority white and majority upper income. And so, and I, I don't believe there have been many developments that have included affordable housing. So uh, I'm just wondering if you have a thought specifically about that and how the building, at least this building, does have permanently affordable housing. Uh, uh, yeah, I cannot answer for the other projects. I, I didn't consult all of them, but um... I mean, but there is already, I mean, this, as we know, usually when these developments come to a specific neighborhood, there is already a potential to, I mean, there's a process of gentrification that already started, but these buildings, usually these developments accelerate it. And so instead of minimizing by bringing more housing, in fact, they accelerate because they bring luxury housing. But I don't know about the other developments, if they have, what the percentage of affordable housing they have in there. Okay, thank you. Other questions for Mr. Reyes? Thank you, sir. Um, our next speaker will be Christina Giorgio. Christina Giorgio. Christina Giorgio. Um, Ms. Giorgio doesn't appear to be in the room this moment. Okay. Lars Angstro. Lars Angstro. 
Uh, likewise, I don't see Mr. Angstrau. Okay, we will go back to those in favor, starting with Dr. Feb Cortez, who will be followed by Christopher uh, Cazis, Cazis, Christopher Cazis. Dr. Cortez. Um, hi, good morning. Um, I'm sorry, but my husband has to leave to see his patients, so I'll be um, speaking for the both of the, both of us. Thank my you. name is uh, My name is Maggie Cortez. And um, we've been attending um, International Baptist Church for over 10 years now. And our son goes to um, International Christian School, which we decided and chose um, even before we had him. Um, it was because we love the church and the school. We believe in their mission in, um, and their vision. We do t um, trust Pastor Kazis and the board. They always think what's best for the students, the teachers, and the staff, um, and they are always ready to help. As for the school, um, the school provides quality education at an affordable price compared to other private schools, and um, we believe that this project will help improve the school's resources, and um, which will be beneficial for um, all the students. So for that regard, um, we, vo we vote in... Um, we, uh, we vote um, um, yes for this project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions for Mrs. Cortez? Thank you. Ms. Mart, oh, I'm sorry, Christopher Casas. Christopher Casas. Hello, commissioners. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Christopher Casas, and I don't want to take up much more of your time. I just simply wanted to say that I am a longtime resident. I grew up here and now have the pleasure of living here with my wife and two children. Uh, we love this neighborhood. Uh, and I agree with those who have stated their support for this project. I believe it is a great benefit in addition to our neighborhood, specifically on Park Circle. And I uh, just wanted to voice my support for it. I hope that you will uh, vote to approve it. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Kazis? Thank you. Ms. Marta Reyes, Marta Reyes. Ms. Reyes is not in the room. All righty. If you have not registered to speak, but have decided during the course of this hearing that you would like to, now is the time to register. Again, you can find instructions on how to register, whether online or via phone at www.nyc.gov slash NYC engage. Mr. Vice Chair, would you like to take a brief recess uh, to allow people to register if, um, if they so choose? We don't have anyone else registered for this item. What moment. would you recommend as a recess? Um, we could uh, do five minutes. Uh, well, let me um, let me sample the commission. And, uh, what do you think? Should we plow ahead, or would you like a recess for five minutes? Five minutes would be helpful, I think. That's okay. fine. All right. Right. Let's, let, let's do five minutes. Everybody can sign in. All right. So um, I think we would then reconvene at 1135. That's right. right. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. We stand in recess.
if you're ready to reconvene. I am. Okay. Uh, I will say uh, that it doesn't appear that we have any further registrants, new registrants, but um, we have two speakers who were prior called who have returned to the room. Um, it's uh, Jeannie Hutchins and uh, Lars Engstrom. All righty. Um, in the order of return, let's take Mr. Engstrom and then uh, Ms. Hutchins. Hello, can you hear me? This is Lars Angstrom. Yes. Hi, thank you for uh, hearing from me. Uh, there was some uh, mention of traffic studies and why there would be a traffic study. Um, I'm a resident here for 20 years. My wife is a resident here for 30 years. Um, there's been increasing traffic problems at the at Park Circle as it is. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, trucks, uh, tractor trailers, illegally using the park circle as a shortcut to get to the Prospect Expressway coming off of the truck route at Cape. And um, uh, once they shut down the uh, commuter traffic on the park drive at Prospect Park, the uh, traffic went from bad to untenable. Um, and it's already clogged. And when emergency vehicles, a lot of who use the, the, the park circle to get to different points in hospitals, um, are often stuck at that circle because of the immense amount of traffic. Um, the impact of several hundred more units using the circle for their own vehicles, for services, for deliveries, I can't imagine it getting any worse than it is now, but it would be if this happened. And um, the, uh, the F train stop is always crowded um, as it is on uh, commute times and pre-pandemic levels. And uh, I just can't imagine what it's gonna be uh, with all these new units. Um, uh, furthermore, the, 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 the conditions as it is, there is a, uh, I live at 30 Ocean Parkway and there's a gas line that has been ruptured from the heavy truck traffic on our little access road that connects to the uh, Prospect, Park, uh, Prospect Expressway on-ramp. Um, there's a lot of damage uh, being done. A lot of the trees are dying, somebody else commented. Um, uh, the, the amount of traffic and noise and pollution is becoming unbearable. And I can't imagine that anybody living at this large tower would have a pleasant uh, living experience there because of all of this. Um, the other thing is that, you know, you're talking about 25% affordable housing. That means 75% of the housing is going to be uh, a market rate luxury, which means if you have 75% of those apartments going on the local market at luxury rates, all that's going to do is either to keep the high rents in the neighborhood or drive them higher. Um, the Kestrel on, on Caton Avenue has something like 22 uh, available rental units. Why can't those be changed to low, uh, uh, to low cost housing? Um, I, I, I think that just developing a new building when there's a lot of vacancies on these overpriced apartment buildings would be, a, uh, it's, it doesn't make any sense unless you're looking through the lens of, uh, of, of making a profit for people who want to build a building who have no connection to the neighborhood and aren't interested in the negative impacts to the neighborhood. Um, and so that's basically what I have to say about it. Thank you, Mr. Angstrom. Questions for Mr. Angstrom? Thank you, sir. Jeannie Hutchins? Yes, hello. Um, thank you for inviting us to speak. Um, I, I agree with almost everything that's been said by the other people in opposition. We are definitely not opposed to affordable housing in our neighborhood. As a matter of fact, our main objection is to the fact that as Lars has just said, um, the feeling is that what will dominate will be not affordable housing and that it will increase a lot of the problems that we already have, which are a matter of scale in terms of traffic and the noise has become very, very serious problem. And the proximity to the park is a real issue because as many people know in Prospect Park, a few years ago, a, a building went up on the Ocean Avenue side that's just a, a complete eyesore and it, and it uh, diminishes the appreciation of the park aesthetically. But aside from that, the noise will impact this edge of the park also, the noise from that circle. Um, navigating the Machate Circle is already very challenging. As a biker, I experience it daily and pedestrians. A friend of mine was hit by an SUV uh, about a block from there not long ago. Um, we don't want to increase the number of people here just for the sake of having 
some developer with a wonderful design um, bring tax dollars into the city. We feel that planning needs to be far more far reaching. We appreciate the sustainability and the lead issues that are being considered. That's all wonderful green roofs and so forth. But the um, affordable housing factor really we think should be a much larger percentage of it. And we also very seriously feel that the scale of this building is totally out of proportion with the rest of the neighborhood. Um, not just aesthetically, although definitely aesthetically, although it's a lovely design, it's totally out of keeping with our neighborhood. And the size of the area being addressed is actually quite humble. It's not a huge area. And the buildings nearby top out at six to seven stories. And we feel that that's where this project should top out at. We're in sympathy with the church considerations and with the community. Uh, having a retail space would be lovely, although not on Caton Place, which I think would drive those people crazy and it wouldn't be very uh, convenient. But it's the scale of this and the fact that we feel that it will ultimately turn into another example of luxury housing and profits before people and um, development before thinking about it thoroughly. Um, we appreciate your consideration. Thanks very much for letting me speak. Thank you, Ms. Hudgens. Uh, Question for Ms. Questions for Ms. Hutchins. Any questions? Thank you. We will now turn to speakers in favor, uh, starting with uh, Ms. Maria Nelly Perez, who will be followed by Mr. Jason Grant. Ms. Perez? Yes, good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> okay, I guess you hear me. I, we oh. do. Okay, good morning, commissioners and all in attendance. My name is Maria Nelly Perez, and I live in Brooklyn for almost 30 years. I have been a member of the International Baptist Church for over 10 years. Uh, the church has been a home away from home for me and my family, and for many years, I have enjoyed all the activities and supports that are provided at this, at this uh, facility. I know that many other congregants feel the same way I do, because uh, in my case, I did send my nephew uh, to the um, International Christian School, uh, being an NYU and NYC DOE employee. I felt that uh, my faith was more important to send my nephew, and then he graduated from that fantastic school. At International Baptist Church, I have found a group of people who care about each other. I am very grateful to be part of that community. Uh, this project, um, I know is going to have a huge impact in our church. The project will give our community, our church, a better facilities. Uh, I know that the, the school is going to be excellent and my hope is that I will be able to join them one day. Um, uh, I know that the supports that are provided are not only to the English congregation, we have the Spanish congregation and we have the um, sign language congregation. Uh, we do support um, many missions around the world and everything is taking place at that facility. Um, the financial, um, this, this project will definitely provide us a better um, building and we also provide us the financial resources to continue providing services to the community. Because of these reasons, I am in favor of this project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Perez. Questions for Ms. Perez? Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Jason Grant. Yes, good morning, and thank you for allowing me to have this opportunity to speak in favor of this project. Uh, I want to thank uh, everyone here involved, and uh, I want to say that I've been uh, not only a member of this community, but uh, I've been living in Brooklyn for the majority of my life, right? Uh, this, this proposed project would help the community. I, I heard someone mention earlier that they worked for the city. I too work for the city. I have many years working for the city and I live here. I live by Prospect Park. 
this, uh, they said that the housing would not be affordable, but I'm here to tell you that, you know, it is possible to do so. All right. And I'm a father of two. I'm married with two children and I'm still able to afford and work and live here. All right. So this new uh, project will actually help the community and of help with public housing. I mean, allowing people affordable housing. And I think that's very, very important for the community. As for the, uh, the neighborhood in which the church is currently in the property that the current the church is currently on. Uh, I've seen some of the buildings that were going up, and I know this was mentioned before, but some of the buildings that are going up are an eyesore. I mean, the storage unit and so on and so forth are huge, and they're seen uh, from from very far away because it's, it's, it's huge. However, uh, something so positive as a church which cares about the community uh, is is going to be such a huge help in, in, in being, bringing beauty to the neighborhood and bringing community to the neighborhood, bringing help to the neighborhood. We need a facility so we can provide more services for our community. And this, in this day and age, it's very, very crucial that we have that. Um, we don't have a lot of projects like that. Now, it's been my personal experience that the, uh, the church and the church body have been doing that. They actually, a community church has been working with the community in many, many projects in order to help the uh, help bring up the community, right? And all of the testimonies I've heard thus far, right? I haven't heard a lot about how they have been reaching out to the buildings. And some of the uh, testimonies that we heard when we were talking, when they were talking about the buildings in the area, uh, they weren't really thinking about or even mentioning the fact that the church itself, the pastor himself, the staff themselves reach out to work with and are active in the community. Even the police department next door, they're actively working with them, actively helping them, and they help us, right? It's a beautiful community, and that's what it's all about, you know? It's about serving our God, doing what we're supposed to do, and helping the community, right? So we need this facility so we can provide services that are much needed for our community. I'm in favor of this, and um, I think that it's important. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Grant. Questions? Thank you. Um, are there any additional speak, uh, speakers registered, Ryan? Uh, just let me check the, the um, poll, just one moment. Is that Jan Degnan? Jan Degnan. I do not see Ms. Degnan in the in the uh, room, but she did appear on the registration. Uh, so, so we uh, can, yeah, she's not here. All right. Uh, is there anyone else present who would like to speak on this item? If so, and you have already registered to speak online, please use the raise hand function. If you are accessing the hearing by phone, please press star nine to be added to the queue. Uh, um, we actually don't have that function turned on. I don't, sorry that that's in your script. That's, uh, that's old. Um, okay. But, but uh, we, we don't have any further uh, folks in the, in the registration. So. Okay. If there the are room. no additional speakers uh, registered or present, then uh, this hearing is closed. Thank you. Our next item, Laurel Brooklyn, calendars number 11 and 12, CD2, Calendar number 11, C150178 ZMK. Calendar number 12, N180178 ZRK. A public hearing in the matter of applications for zoning map and zoning text amendments concerning 265 Front Street rezoning. 
Ready? Okay, our first speaker uh, in favor will be Eric Polotnik. Eric. Okay, did I do this right? Uh, can you hear me? I can. We can. That's great, and it's a pleasure to see all of you, and I have high standards to live up to after the perfection of the last hearing. Thank you. Can you see me, by the way? We cannot. Okay, so I can keep it in my shorts. I can stay I can stay on dress. Great. I think you better proceed, Eric. I'm going to continue. Thank you very much for spending the time this morning, everybody. My name is Eric Palatnik, and I'm here today to present with you to 265 Front Street, which is a rezoning to permit an R6A C24 overlay, which is an extension of an existing R6A adjacent to the premises on a 6,000-square-foot lot in the Dumbo slash Vinegar Hill section of Brooklyn. It is a corner lot on the corner of Gold and Front Street in a neighborhood that is a mixed use, historically manufacturing, but changing more and more. Next slide, please. This gives you an idea of what the proposed conditions are. And I know that the commission had a lot of questions yesterday about why we're coming in in an R6A development at a proposal that you can see on the right-hand side it results in a 16,927 square foot development, 11,932 square feet of which would be residential, 4,995 square feet, which would be commercial, totaling 16,927 square feet, which is a 2.6 FAR, that's the key, and not a 3.6. And the reason for that, I'm going to go through with you, is a long history that we've been working with the community. We've been working with the community in Aldona, who you're going to hear from, and the community board since 2014. When we first met with them years ago, everybody said to us, we don't want to see a super tall building here. And the owner, who's the Mr. Pasatoro family and the Spinard family, who uses the site for many years, for many decades, as a trucking facility for their contracting uh, business, have no desire to, to not abide by the community's request. So they worked very closely with the councilman, the community board, everybody to come up with a building that was 51 feet tall, this obscure FAR 2.6, yes, below the MIH requirement, but because nobody in the neighborhood wanted the building taller. And I think you're seeing, seeing that by my denial at the community board with the R6B discussion. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this just gives you an idea of the neighborhood, and it's a New York Times article. Uh, just pull about Vinegar Hill. Next slide, please. This is, I'm going to come back to this in a moment, but Dustin Hoffman has a little bit to do with this. You see him here in Tootsie, you see him here in Kramer versus Kramer, you see him here in Outbreak, and you see him here in the bottom in Death of a Salesman. I'll come back to that in a second on why that's relevant. Next slide, please. Next slide, next slide. You can keep clicking to a couple slides, please. Right there, you can stop. Here you can see the mixed-use character. Up, oh, go back one slide, please. Here you can see the mixed-use character of the neighborhood. The site is positioned in the top of the, the screen where it's it's uh, it's in outline. The bottom of the screen, you can see a six-story residential building. That's in an R6A area, uh, zoning district. To the left of us, the vacant site is an R6B zoning district. Behind us is an R6B. And the vacant corner lot, on the lower left is an R6A. That corner lot historically has a lot to do with why our application took so long to come through the process and all of the discussions that went on in the community. From what I understand, nothing to do with us, but before we got involved and as we started to do our rezoning, there was some sort of demolition on that site uh, that's tried to, uh, tried to do something, I think, to go beyond the scope of uh, what the neighborhood desired. And I think we, we caught the tail end of that. That's why our rezoning took us a very long time, and that's why we tried to tailor the size to the 2.6 FAR 51 feet tall development that you see in front of you now. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. I'm sorry, the screens are lagging a bit. Uh, here you can see the site. It's no looker. Uh, it, it, it's, it's one of the most, uh, uh, I, I think, uh, a negative site in a beautiful neighborhood, and they're using it entirely within their rights. 
the Pasatoro slash Bernard family, they are in the contracting business. They work heavy equipment. They're in that site at 5 in the morning. They're starting up diesel trucks. If it's cold out, the diesel runs longer and louder, and they get in there at 6 o'clock at night, they turn those trucks off. They try to be respectful of everybody. They've been there for decades, but they're done. The gentlemen who own the business are a bit older. They have no desire to keep running their contracting business there or their trucks. And if the zoning doesn't get approved, which is sort of where we are, that's where the Dustin Hoffman death of a salesman part comes in. Uh, we're sort of left in a tragedy where we're left with this site, which is what I don't think anybody wants. Uh, next slide, please. Fine. How are we on time? Are we? We're out. We're out of okay. Time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Polotnik. Uh, questions for Mr. Polotnik? Uh, Commissioner De La Uz. Hi, Eric. Uh, um, how many more slides do you have left? Because I, I, I think that you started to talk about like where you guys were started in this conversation and the conversations that you've been having with the community board. Um, I, I guess I'm trying to understand the gap between what you're saying about those uh, conversations and the fact that there's still opposition. Okay, and I'd love, thank you for giving me the opportunity. And, and, and Vice Chair, I did try to sign up for 10 minutes uh, so I could take the entire presentation of my team, but that's neither here nor there. Commissioner De Luz, thank you for giving me the time. Uh, so the, 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 the guts and the root of the problem is that slide I showed you before with Dustin Hoffman. We are the child in Kramer versus Kramer. We're stuck between the community board's desires that we desire to abide by. We want to build what the community wants. We don't desire to disrupt what anybody wants. That's why we're Tootsie also. We're trying to satisfy everybody. In the middle of it, an outbreak occurred, but that's who we are and where we are. The community board, I believe, and the opposition who they'll, you'll speak to, uh, I believe are not opposed to a residential development here. I believe what they're opposed to is what could be constructed under R6A. And they, for their own personal reasons, will not accept the restrictive declaration to keep the height lower. So we have agreed and, and, and desire to accommodate them with an R6B, but we're out of scope by an R6B. And an R6B would have to be accepted by the commission, which is one of the things we wanted to discuss with you today. Okay. We're happy to do what anybody wants. We do not want to leave it as a trucking facility that it is now. And, and, and I'm sure our owners are older. I'm sure they'll sell it. Whoever comes in there next, use it in as of right capacity, will also have the same privilege of, of disruptive manufacturing uses. So we have no desire to do that. Uh, we're not speculators and we are trying to work closely with everybody, recognizing that we're not providing affordable housing. And I, more than anybody, am on board with the, the mission of affordable housing, and I understand that this is not, and, and, and I, I wish the site was bigger and it could accommodate it. But that's the discussion that's going on right now. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to provide the, the background. If I could just quickly follow up on that, just kind of a clarifying question. So, you, so you've offered a restrictive declaration to the community and that that has just been rejected yes we yes we have offered anything and and, and they have valid reason for it i'm not going to discount their reasons they had a, an interaction in another development i learned when i was at their meetings that that a, a restricted declaration they felt was not adhered to so they they felt burned by that so i can understand their concerns uh but again we're in the middle of everybody we will accommodate anybody's request that's involved in this process we just want to build something other than uh, a warehouse Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Bernie. Uh, thank you. D do you have a uh, ground floor plan in your slide deck there? We do. It's at the very end. If I can ask the person that happens to be running the uh, slides, if you can go to the end of the slide package, I don't know which slide it is, but you'll see a plan package, and you'll see a rendering in there, and you'll also see the floor plans. And the ar architect is on the phone. We heard your comments the other day about okay. having him on. And uh, he's on. There you go. If you go one more slide, you should get to the floor plan. One more, two more, maybe. There you go. Oh, you just had it right back. One back, one slide. Okay. So, so how do you envisage this commercial space being occupied? Do you have retail tenants in mind, or what's the? the well, idea? I'm glad you asked that question because we had agreed. It came up during further discussions with the community that nobody in the neighborhood wants to see any commercial there. Original discussions where we tried to restrict it to what would be non-intrusive uses, such as a veterinarian or, or, or things that are quiet, nothing like a bodega or a deli or a Starbucks. Uh, but 
But after we got to the community board hearings, uh, it was made very clear that nobody wants to see any commercial there. So we agreed to actually eliminate the commercial entirely and just ask for an R6B. Uh, we had envisioned uh, originally in the outset of the project either a satellite library or, uh, like I said, a veterinary clinic or, or other quiet a bank, uh, other kinds of quiet retail uses. And we were we had given the community board a list of those or the, the neighbors a list of those uses, and we tried to work around those. As I said, at the end of the discussions, it became clear that nobody wanted to see a disruptive, what they considered to be any sort of disruption to the street with the commercial use, and we did agree to eliminate uh, the commercial overlay. Uh, that, that was the, the background on that whole the ground floor issue. So, so what are we looking at here then? Because this clearly says commercial office space. So what does that mean? What you're looking at here is this was accompanied by, uh, in our discussions with the community board, a list of uses that we were willing to restrict the uses to. So we had included a, a bakery, a barber shop, a, barber, a, a drug store, dry cleaners, uh, a laundry. Uh, these are different use group six uses that we had agreed that we we're trying to uh, allow the community to accept a florist, a furniture store, stuff like that. So that's what we were trying to depict there, although that's not shown there. Those were the discussions we were having until the time that we got to the community board. So do you think the space will be subdivided then? Uh, we would think if it was approved as is, it would be subdivided, and it would be a host of other smaller uses. Uh, but we wouldn't even want to – we'd want to abide by the community's rec request. I think even if we were granted the R6 right now with the C2, uh, we might be inclined to continue with the R6 uh, mm -hmm. at, at their request because they were very vocal with us, or at least to restrict the uses. Uh, we do intend to stand by what we promised them, which is to have – non-intrusive uses at that lower level. Uh, mm -hmm. So we would be subdividing it most likely. Yeah. It would probably be smaller spaces. It seems pretty unusual for a community to not want to have local retail, but I guess they have their reasons. Yeah, yeah. you'll have to ask them. And, and yeah. we did talk to them for a long time about it. Uh, mm -hmm. They do have their reasons. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, my second question just had to do with the comments that we raised at the review about the sort of architectural expression of the building. This is going to be a, a building built in 2021 or 22, and uh, one would hope to see a more contemporary piece of architecture. Uh, yeah, ben, Le ben Leonardi is on the phone. He's the project architect. Uh, if you can scroll, uh, whoever's controlling the screen, if you could please go to a few more screens forward. Uh, in the presentation, you'll see, or towards the back of it, I should say, you'll see a rendering or an image of the, the premises. Uh, I think Ben, when I spoke to him about this, he, he, there's one in color too, but you can get the sense here. He was trying to draw off of, uh, there you go. He was trying to draw off of the building to the left. Vinegar Hill is obviously a century old community, uh, historic neighborhood. And that's where he found himself in the middle of what this image doesn't show you is to the right across the street, as you probably are aware, is a is a glass uh, uh, and concrete oriented modern more or more modern building I should say mm -hmm. or current day, so we're happy to accommodate everybody's desires with design also. Uh, we were trying to accommodate the neighborhood. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, and, and I appreciate the scale and the massing and so on. But where I draw the line, with, with these arches, which are not at all contextual to the neighborhood and don't really bear any relation to the structure, uh, and the idea of, of subdividing. Uh, windows back to the days when you did not have float glass it seems a little crazy because that's not even contextual either. So there were just some details I think that were too too retrograde, at least for my taste. Commissioner Bernie, just let me say uh, the architect is on the list of speakers, so you, you'll have uh, the opportunity to uh, uh, question him directly if, oh, if you okay. wish. Terrific. Then I, that's all I have for now. All right. Uh, Commissioner Levin? Okay. Okay. Um, yes, Mr. Polotnick, I wonder if I'm a little confused here, um, or maybe I just misheard. Um, you explained the long history that the um, owner has with this site, but explained that that, uh, that there, as I think as you put it, they are done, and we're likely not. So, is it the case that they will not be the ones to develop it? That they will sell this to another developer? Uh, let, let me let me clarify for you. When I say they're done, uh, I say in a sense they are older gentlemen. They are they are entering their 70s. Uh, they do heavy equipment work, driving trucks. 
They're hardworking guys. They've been doing blue collar work, and uh, and they're done in the sense that uh, they're not envisioning their golden years driving the trucks and moving the machinery. Uh, so they would be developing it. Their partners, uh, one of the gentlemen who's on the line also is a Joe Passatoro. Uh, Joe is a, is an engineer and he's he, he's uh, thirty or so years younger than the other owners. And Joe is a developed and he's he's a partner with them. And Joe desires to be the one that's going to develop the property uh, for residential. What I was saying they're done is nobody desires uh, to to continue on with their their trucking business there okay. where they do their. Okay, so, but so it is the applicant's intention to be the ones to realize yeah. these plans. Yeah, that is their okay. desire. Um, so um, help me, and I appreciate this has had a, a a very long history. I now realize, looking at our briefing sheet, that the application was first filed in 2014. And that's like a lifetime ago. Yeah. Um, but can you explain to me why, it, if if you've now essentially agreed with the um, community to, you know, sort of an R6B shaped building. Why was this filed as R6A? It, that's a very good question. And it was filed as R6A because since the beginning of the application, we've been trying to achieve as the developer, uh, the 2.6 FAR, which is in the middle of the 2.2 that R6B uh, affords and the 3.6. It was an off the shelf creation to try to accommodate the commercial at the ground floor and residential above. And it was also made to accommodate the zoning rationale, which is that there are is a strong R7A presence around us, in addition to an R6B. Uh, also, I mentioned at the beginning uh, that while we were making those filings, uh, there was a big dispute with what was going on across the street. So the community was very sensitive to height. Uh, so that's how we got to this middle ground of having the building that, that achieves the R6B height of 51 feet, uh, but it goes above the R6B floor area ratio. So we're in this hybrid area. And we were working very closely with everybody on the process the whole way through. I think the community neighbors, some of the neighbors, changed their position on it the last minute, which they are fully entitled to. Uh, and, and that's how things sort of ended up where we are right now. Um, the referring to the uh, site across the street, do you mean 251 front? I mean diagonally across okay. the street. Uh, yeah. Okay. okay, not the one that uh, went through ULURP and then got pulled at city council, which was 251 front. No, I believe it's 251 front. I'm going to look it up while we're talking, but I believe 251 front, the one that got pulled. Okay. Yeah, I think it is that one. It is that one. Okay, that's immediately across the street, not city council. So we, you know, we just ended up in the middle of a, of a lot, and that's how it ended up taking seven years, okay. or six years. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Dweck. Uh, thank you. Um, my uh, fellow commissioners touched on most of the uh, points and questions, but perhaps, Eric, you can shed some light on, if there was no action, what the um, legal re retail uh, um, use that the ground floor would be under the current zoning and how that would impact the community. Well, that, that would be the death of a salesman slide that I showed you. It would be a tragedy because I don't think anybody wants to see the site go to a pure as of right, whether it be a, an as of right retail use. We've already heard from the community that they don't want that, a Starbucks or a similar type of a, a, a local coffee shop or a local business, a local restaurant. <laughs> All of that can go in there. And that's probably the best that can go in there. The worst of it could be things that, such as the current user is using now, which is where he stores his diesel equipment and his trucks. He stores payloaders there. These are not small pieces of machinery. Uh, so I don't think anybody wants that. We don't want it. I think the neighbors want it. Uh, so that's why we're, we're really trying to make it clear to everybody that we're willing to accommodate anybody's requests. Thank, thank you. Any further questions for uh, Mr. Polotnik? Okay, thank you, sir. Is, thank you. Uh, is council member Stephen Levin uh, present? Okay, if not. Uh, uh, no, 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 he is. Mr. He is? For sure, yes. Okay, councilman? We can, we can see who's him. In who's in opposition? Councilman Stephen Levin. Can you 
he is unmuted and and in the room. So, okay. Oh, 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 oh. Can, can you hear me now? Yes. Can you yes, hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Great. Okay. Um. Thank you very much. I um, I uh, appreciate the opportunity. I'll, I'll keep this brief. Um. So I, I am uh, testifying in opposition. Um, however, what the reason being that it's as as um, Commissioner Levin just um, uh, pointed out, um, we did turn down um, or ask the applicant to withdraw the uh, application at 251 Front Street a few years ago um, because uh, they proceeded with a with a, um, a 6A application. Um, the Vineyard Hill community, which is very small. Um, you know, really just a, a, a couple of blocks um, uh, was not supportive of a 6A application um, and were willing to have uh, what, what they see as more contextual in their neighborhood um, as a 6B. Um, and uh, at that point, the applicant was, was unwilling to um to do that and so uh, we asked we asked that they withdraw that um so as it relates to this site um we would be supportive i would be supportive of a 6b application uh but um i can't be supportive of a, of a 6a application um so I'm uh, I'm testifying um, in opposition today. Um, I, I I would have hoped that that there there could have been a concurrent 6B application filed, um, uh, but that doesn't seem to be um, uh, in the cards. So uh, this has to do with. Um, uh, you know, adhering to the context of that neighborhood um, and um, and that the it's a very small community it's it's not a um, uh, you know a very um, uh, you know overly uh, privileged or wealthy community it's uh, the, the people that I know that live in vinegar Hill have all lived there for, you know, 30 or 40 years or longer. Um, uh, they're artists um, or union workers. Um, and um, and they, they have this small little hamlet that is um, unique in the borough of Brooklyn. Um, there's really not another neighborhood that is really anything like this that I know of. And, um, and so, you know, in, in order to keep the, um, you know, the context of that, of that, of that neighborhood, um, that, that is, uh, um, a reasonable position in my, in my opinion. Um, and it's not as if they don't want any residential, um, but they they asked that it be a, a 6B uh, contact. So I, I'm in line with the community's wishes on that. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, thank you, Councilman Levin. Uh, can you stand by for uh, questions? Sure, of course, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, first, I, I believe we've been advised by the department that a 6B application is out of scope, would be out of scope in the context of this application. Is that correct, Ryan? Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, sure. Yeah. All right. Uh, Commissioner Levin. All right. Yes. Thank you for being here, Council Member. Um, we had quite a discussion about exactly this issue at the review session on Monday, and I anticipate we will continue to discuss it as long as the ULR clock allows us to, because this is a complicated application. Um, but one of the things that we were told um, yesterday or Monday during our discussion is that an R6B 
uh, would be contrary to the Department of City Planning's policy of mapping MIH in any situation where we're increasing residential de density. Uh, because you can't, you don't, you know, R6B doesn't qualify for the MIH. So um, clearly right. we've got a city policy that would favor um, R6A here in order to achieve uh, some MIH. Do you have a thought on that? Right. Well, in this case, um, because of the application that you're seeing before you, there it would not be an MIH project um, right. because it, it would be under under the the ten unit threshold for MIH. So, as as you all know, I've I've been very in favor of MIH projects throughout my district and have probably had, you know, among council districts in the top five easily in terms of the number of rezoning and MIH units, um, uh, I would think, uh, between 80 Flatbush and Domino and um, uh, the Brooklyn Heights Library. Um, so I'm not, a, I'm not in any way ever been opposed to, to density or um, to, to density um, and of course supported for MIH to support MIH. Um, uh, in, in this case, it, there, there wouldn't be an MIH um benefit i mean there wouldn't be a you know there wouldn't actually be a produced unit so um in a practical sense i don't you know i i the i can't really speak to the to it as a kind of policy issue but in a, in a practical sense i don't you know i don't see that being an issue right that's that is indeed one of the additional conundrums here is that we have the applicant mm -hmm. um assuring us of their willingness to um build to a a scale that's closer to an R6B, but the thing is that before us is simply a rezoning application and there's no way we can make those commitments stick. So right. Another, right. another problematic aspect here. Anyway, thank you. Right. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, Commissioner Dweck. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if this is a question uh, for the council member, but from what I understood your comments earlier, that the department deems that it would be out of scope, that would mean that if this passes an R6A and the council sends it back as a modification to an R6B, that would be considered out of scope? That's my uh, understanding, believe, yeah. That's yeah, I believe it would be, yeah. Got it. All right, thank you for the clarification. Uh, hold on a sec. Uh, Commissioner De La Uz. Um, thanks for being here, Council Member Levin. I, you know, first, I just want to say I'm looking thanks. forward to the review session follow up to kind of talk further about the out of scope nature of it, especially given the practical concerns that were just raised. I, I guess I, I just I want to check on something right. Um, you know, I think sometimes communities raise issues of context um, when when ra rather than say they're opposing affordable housing and i'm just wondering if you feel satisfied that in this case it's it's about the desire for context and and not concern about having a, a project that actually would trigger mih 100 uh, percent um I, there's no doubt in my mind this is a community they're they're there i mean because they're um a lot of these a lot of these uh uh residents have you know put a lot of sweat equity into their units when they you know bought them in the 70s and 80s and 90s um you know this it was uh you know this was this is a um you know they they really treasure the the the, the that, that um hamlet nature of of vinegar hill and um, it's definitely very it, unique, no question. Physically. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, but, but that being said, it is directly across the street from, from a NYCHA development. And mm -hmm. I've, you know, it's, I've never heard a, a, a single uh, uh, complaint or um, any type of, of, like, issues that residents in Vinegar Hill have raised about being across the street from Farragut Houses. So, um, I, this is very much about building context and not wanting 
basically, it's, I, honestly, it's more about Dumbo encroaching into Vinegar Hill. That's what they're, that's really what, as if you were to ask them, uh, that's what they would say, in my opinion, is, is they don't, they, they don't want Vinegar encroaching, in, I mean, they don't want Dumbo encroaching into Vinegar Hill. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Uh, any further questions for council member Levin? If not, thank you, sir. Thank you all. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Okay, we're going to uh, resume uh, speakers in favor uh, with uh, Joseph Passatoro, who will be followed by Ben Leonardi. Joseph Passatoro. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I'm the project engineer on, on the project and uh, related to the Spinards who are the owner of the property. So I'll be doing most of the engineering in conjunction with uh, Ben Leonardi, who's a, the architect with Miley and Associates. Uh, we've been trying to work with the community uh, to basically accommodate them as much as possible. That's why this whole thing went from a uh, R6A to us looking at doing, agreeing to do the R6B. We have an A application ready uh, to go for our lawyer to submit if you guys are willing to accept it and hoping you would that would turn turn this into an R6B project as I said we've been willing to work with the community the local representatives uh, Vinegar Hill Civic Association to accommodate uh, it's just a matter of that it, as you said before it's a, a lifetime ago we've been doing this for going on eight years and we kind of feel like we're trapped in the middle between city council and uh, the local community board but as I said, we're, we're open to any suggestions. And that's really all I have to say. Thank you. Uh, questions for Mr. Uh, Pasatudo? Okay. Uh, Mr. Ben Leonardi, the architect, I believe. Ben Leonardi? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. What am I doing wrong? Brian, do you want to explain to him what he needs to do? Yeah, can you try uh, unmute yourself again, Mr. Leonardi? Should be able to. He is in the room. He just needs to unmute his his uh, his team or his Zoom. Yeah, I'd like to have him speak before yeah, we go we, to speakers opposed. Um, uh, Mr. Leonardi, can you hear me? Let's unmute your uh, your thing. There should be a button. I'm prompting you. There we go. Hello. There we go. We can hear you. This is, this is Ben Leonardi. Okay. I, I apologize, but I I cut the uh, the meeting off. No All need. Right. Any, any, I'm getting an echo. I don't understand why. But uh, all right. At any rate, the thing that I wanted to. Well, I don't know what the echo is. I don't know why there's an echo. We can hear you. All right. Um, base, basically, what I'm trying to deal with is we wanted to keep a low profile of a building, uh, and we wanted to keep it in character with some of the buildings that are down the street. There are some older buildings down the street that uh, when we designed it, originally we were going to go to a contemporary design, but then we looked at it and we wanted to be more in tune with the community. So uh, we redesigned the initial designs and we went to a more uh, uh, eclectic, you know, design with the, the uh, uh, buildings down the block. If you look at the rendering, you can see the buildings that we were uh, adjacent to and we tried to, you know, sort of mimic that, uh, that development. The other thing is what we were concerned about is we really didn't want to go too high with the building 
because the streets are not really that wide and we're concerned about, you know, overpowering the street and creating, you know, darkness in the area. So we wanted to keep a low profile. And that's basically it in a nutshell. I, I was, you know, I just did the design work on it. And uh, obviously there's a lot more to tweak when we uh, get involved in the interior and whatnot. Okay. Uh, are there questions for uh, uh, Mr. Leonardi, Commissioner Bernie, perhaps? Yes. Yes, uh, thank you, Vice Chair. Um, yeah, Mr. Leonardi, I, I don't mean to beat a dead horse here, I, and I totally agree with you. I think the scale and massing of the building is fine. I just have some really minor details. I, I think that the, the subdivision of the windows into those tiny astragals is not really consistent with some of the other buildings on the site, and it's really not necessary in the days of, of float glass. And also uh, the arches, I feel, are also not really consistent with the, uh, with the rest of the architecture and somehow or another don't really fit with the structure of the building and with the fenestration above. So I just wondered if you might re-look re at those couple of things. But other than that, I, I think I agree with you, the building um, in, in other respects uh, fits in perfectly well. Okay. Any further questions for uh, Mr. Leonardi? Thank you. We'll now go to uh, speakers in opposition, starting with Ms. Margot Hirsch, who will be followed by uh, Mr. Aldona Vicunas. Vicunas. Ms. Hirsch? Good, good afternoon, commissioners. Can you hear me? We can, yes. Great, thank you. I. I will not repeat anything that has been said by our council member who really did a great job representing what we want. I will say I have been a resident of Vinegar Hill for over 35 years, so I have seen a lot of development in the area. The development has been consistent with the, with the venue. There's been small houses such as the townhouses on Little and Plymouth Street, and, and um, the building on, on Front Street that was within the zoning of the area. The building in question that had been talked about before 99 Gold Street is a pre-existing building. It was grandfathered in when the rezoning took place and it was an old toy factory. So it is larger, but and it is right across the street from the, the, the building at 265, but it's been there for 60, 70, 80 years. I will also say in, in response to one of the commissioner's questions before, there is plenty of commercial businesses in the area. They're in Dumbo, they're a block away. Um, there's a vet there, there's a library on, on John Street that just opened. So those commercial Places are not needed in our area. There is plenty. We have now have Wegmans that's uh, about two blocks away from us as well. So to keep the keep any change in the area consistent with the context of the area is all we're asking for. We did oppose our six um, A and spoke to the Spinards at great length about it. And it was our understanding that they had agreed to amend their uh, application and make and uh, apply for R6B. We are fir firmly in favor of R6B. There's no doubt that that would be a benefit to our community if they were to do that. As to the mandatory inclusionary, the Spinards never, never had a plan to do more than nine units. So it would not be applicable in this case. Um, with that, I will uh, leave it to Aldona, who will speak on behalf of, of the Vinegar Hill Neighborhood Association. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions for Ms. Hirsch? Okay. Uh, Aldona, Aldona uh, Vicunas. Aldona Vicunas. Uh, Mr. Valkunas is uh, in the 
meeting. There we go. He's un he's unmuted, so he can just speak. Mr. Bakunas. Sounds like he's maybe trying to speak. Yeah, he is. Uh, I don't think I can do anything on my end. Do you want to go to uh, Mr. Church and then we'll come back to Mr. Vacunas? Can somebody help him? Sure, we can try that. Uh, Bartow Church, Mr. Bartow Church. Yep, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Great. Uh, first off, I want to thank the City Planning Commission for accepting our testimony and listening to our concerns today. Uh, my name is Bardo Church and I live in Vinegar Hill at 75 Gold Street, which is a historic three-story townhome immediately adjacent to 265 Front. I'm also a member of our neighborhood association. Uh, I and many of our neighbors fully support residential development, affordable housing, and progress in Vinegar Hill. We've demonstrated this by welcoming new neighbors, new buildings over the years to our little neighborhood. We cannot, however, welcome or support out of context development such as the R6A spot zoning application for 265 Front Street that's being considered today. I'm sure you've read our community letters and probably been to our neighborhood, so I don't need to remind you of the small character driven feel that has thrived here since the early 19th century. My building is a typical vinegar home. It's brick, it's Greek revival, it stands just 34 feet high. R6A zoning is proposed next door, as you know, it can reach 85 feet as of right. Um, this juxtaposition is the same story between all the historic homes and developable spaces in our neighborhood. And frankly, we're just worried that the R6A or any other larger designation will simply just be at odds with the neighborhood and we'll begin to just pepper the vacant lots and uh, low rise buildings around the, the, uh, our low line streetscapes. Um, this zoning is also what CB2, VHNA, and city determined in 1998 was the de facto congruent zoning for the neighborhood. As Margo said, the few R6A designations that exist were grandfathered in, um, they were already built, and they were too bulky to be designated as R6B. Um, and right now the developers are asking to stretch this R6A designation from one of these existing historic buildings across the boundary of Front Street into the block where the R6B is already the envelope. Um, really like 265 should just fall into this R6B envelope and not what exists across the street, down the street, or in Dumbo. Um, we also think that this change would set two very unfortunate precedents. The first is, you know, the spot zoning kind of creates an open season on the vacant lots and low-lying buildings around Dumbo, I'm sorry, around Vinegar Hill. Um, and the second precedent is the owners and developers can get this up zoning under the guise of this MIH affordable housing, uh, but not actually have to build it. This seems completely antithetical to the city mandates this project is relying on for approval. Um, as Margo said, the owners plainly said they have no plans to build affordable housing. It's never been over nine units. And uh, we don't see any reason that they're going to, to change that. Um, they are, as you know, Eric said, they are willing to build R6B on this lot, and we encourage you guys to allow it if you can. And if not, you know, encourage them to resubmit the application. And uh, we'll work with them. You know, we want more residential, we want affordable housing, we want progressive development, just not out of context. Um, you know, the, I'm happy to speak to, if you have questions for me, the restrictive declaration you brought up, our opposition to that, commercial, if you're, uh, wanting to learn more about our opposition to that. Um, in summary, asking you guys to stand with the community, CB2, Eric Adams, Stephen Levin, and work with us to maintain and continue building our uh, neighborhood as it is. Thank you very much. Mr. Vice Chair, you're muted. I think you were. Uh, involuntarily. Uh, Commissioner Levin, did you have a question? Well, yes, I just wanted to take Mr. Church up on his offer to discuss with us um, their opposition to the restrictive declaration. I should note that um, that's not typically 
uh, not even more typically. It, that's not anything that the city planning commission or the department of city planning would ever get involved in uh, in rezoning like this. We don't do restrictive declarations, but it sounds like the neighborhood has given the issue some thought too. And I just would be interested in Mr. Church's explaining uh, to us what happened with the um, restricted declaration issue. Sure. Um, you know, our concern is exactly what you say. It's not a binding agreement between the city and the developer. It's a binding agreement between us and the developer. You know, we're a small, like grossly underfunded neighborhood association. And for some reason, they don't meet their obligations or breach their obligations in contract. All we can do is take them to court. If they start building out of scope, if they start uh, adding in commercial that we didn't agree to, um, or whatever, like that's between us and them. And we just don't have the funds to go and, and fight, uh, you know, litigate. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Uh, other questions for Mr. Church? All righty. Thank you, Mr. Church. Uh, did Mr. V uh, Vicunas uh, return? Ryan, is he available? Uh, we can, we can give him another try. Let's, uh, there we go. Should be allowed to unmute his microphone. Mr. Bakunas, can you unmute your microphone? There we go. You speak into the microphone. Try it now. He is, we can see him muting it and unmuting it, like, but we can't hear him. It's very frustrating. All right, um, well, we have uh, two more speakers, at least. Sure. Uh, this far, Perhaps, so we'll yeah. uh, proceed with Ms. Gallo and uh, we'll see what happens after uh, she speaks. Uh, Doreen Gallo? Yes, I'm here. Proceed, um, thank you. Hi, I am Doreen Gallo and I am testifying on behalf of the Dumbo Neighborhood Alliance. Uh, Vice Chair Knuckles and commissioners, this is my honor to be here before you today. Thank you all for your continued service. Um, in 1998, DNA supported Brooklyn City Planning's R6B recommendation for the part of Vinegar Hill neighborhood that was rezoned with a 50 foot height limit. As you know, R6B districts are generally traditional row house districts that help preserve the scale, the character, and the harmonious streetscapes of the neighborhood. If the manufacturing zone properties adjacent to the Vinegar Hill Historic Districts are to be rezoned, um, the, it is recommended the community would like to see an R6B to match the existing low-rise nature of this neighborhood and bolster their historic district. The Vinegar Hill Neighborhood Historic District is comprised of three small groups of small groups of brick Greek revival row houses. Um, it's very unusual in a historic district that the boundary isn't continuous. Um, industrial expansion and transportation improvements in the early 20th century resulted in the demolition of most of the original structures. The groups of houses that survive within the Vinegar Hill Historic District retain architectural character recalling a significant era in Brooklyn's history. Um, at city planning's review session on Monday, I was concerned that MIA text amendment was added to this proposal. This project does not include MIH, and by approving this proposal, you're setting the precedent that an R6A zone, rezoning can be approved without the MIH units. And this is not, I don't think, in the spirit or the intent of mandatory inclusionary housing. Um, a one block rezoning in Dumbo, referred to as Light Bridges, was upzoned to an R9, um, and the property is adjacent to the Manhattan Bridge, uh, built after 9-11. But it led the way for subsequent upzonings, including 85J, that have mostly overshadowed the historic character of our neighborhood, including the Manhattan Bridge. DNA respectfully asks that the committee reject the proposed rezoning and rezone to R6B. The spot zoning, including commercial, retail, 
component proposed will set a precedent for the future development of the many vacant lots without a comprehensive without comprehensive planning. We propose the site be rezoned to a low rise R six B district in order to reinforce the Vinegar Hill Historic District. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Gallo. Uh, questions for Ms. Gallo? Uh, Commissioner De La Luz. Just want to clarify um, the the MIH. You know, the language in MIH basically says that it, it applies to to certain um, zoning designations, um, but that if it falls, if, if for that particular size lot, regardless of that zoning designation, if it falls below 10 units, then MIH doesn't apply. So I, I think there's just a little clarification there um, about understanding how MIH applies that would, would be helpful as follow-up. Okay. Well, I, I guess I feel that, um, I guess I could speak to Jumbo very well. I can name like several projects where, you know, it's a company or a family that has been in Dumbo for 50 years and this is what their intent and then there's a zoning change <laughs> and that's not what's built or the, you know there's and so I think we're all we've all been down the block with this uh, there's been a lot of bait and switch and um, you know 53 Pearl went through landmarks um, with a you know it was a speculative applicant and then they got the zoning change and it's it's not being built so there's so many things um and i think we're worried um you know an r6b is already a lot bigger than some of the historic the buildings in the historic district so i'm i'm with the community on this we all would like to see something i don't know why it can't fit in the scope what adjustments have to be made but I think that we've lost manufacturing. Um, the, the, the fact that their site looks the way it is, that's on them. And they had a very patient community living around them. But manufacturing in the loss of it in our districts has been a detriment. And with what's happened with COVID, I think it's pretty clear that there's a lot of empty office spaces and a lot of empty luxury housing. And there's not a day when um, you know, there's not a moving truck in Dumbo. So I don't know, be careful if I do rezone. Yeah. Thank, thank you for that. Okay, uh, Ryan, is uh, Mr. Vicunas an option at this point? Uh, he, he appears to have dropped out of the meeting, unfortunately. Okay, all right, then we'll receive, uh, proceed to uh, Ms. Monique uh, Denanchin. I hope that's connect uh, correct pronunciation. Monique Dinanchen. Uh, it appears that uh, Ms. Dinanchen is no longer in the meeting. All righty. Um, so is, is the, uh, is the uh, Access to hearing by phone uh, a relevant option at this at this point? Yeah, uh, people can. Ryan, people, I just want to clarify. Okay. Yes, people can may dial in. If uh, that's a uh, dial-in participant hotline is one eight seven seven eight five three five two four seven, and the meeting ID is six one eight two three seven seven three nine six. Um. So, but we, uh, my, here, let me just, uh, okay, okay. Um, it does not appear that we have any more registered for this particular hearing. All right, so uh, let me just say, if there anyone else uh, present who would like to speak on this item, if so, no? Yeah, we, do, we don't actually, we don't have that, that uh, functionality. Okay. Uh, to, to do All that. right. So if there yeah. if there are no further speakers, as there appears uh, there's not to be or not to be, uh, then the hearing is closed. Commissioners, our next item, Borough of Brooklyn, calendars number thirteen and fourteen, CT sixteen, calendar number thirteen, C two zero 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 five six ZMK, calendar number fourteen, N. 
200057ZRK, a public hearing in the matter of applications for zoning map and zoning text amendments concerning 803 Rockway Avenue rezoning. Uh, okay, there is a, a team presentation. Uh, the applicant team uh, will present for 10 minutes. Uh, the applicant team consists of Susan Wiviat, Brian Coleman, and Penny King. Uh, also available for questions are Carol Gordon, Cassandra Smith, Hercules R. Giroux, Kate Gilmore, Don Flagg, and Jack Esterson. Uh, please proceed. Uh, good morning. Is, are you here? Can everyone hear me? Yes. Great. Yes. Okay. Um, my name is Susan Wiviet. I'm the CEO of The Bridge. And on this first slide, you see the rendering of the building. And on the bottom, our uh, development team, which includes The Bridge, uh, GMDC, our manufacturing partner, Mega, our development and construction partner, and Think, our project architect. Next slide, please. Uh, the Bridge, we're a 66-year-old New York City nonprofit providing supported housing and services to people living with behavioral health conditions. The Bridge currently houses almost 1,400 people with 569 new units in development. Next, and you can see in the map where our sites are located. Next slide, please. Good afternoon. My name is Brian Coleman. I'm the CEO of the Greenpoint Manufacturing Design Center, GMDC. Um, we've been around for about 30 years. You see some of the highlights of our organization, but I just want to talk about this project briefly. Um, we see the Brownsville project as an exciting opportunity for essentially two mission-driven organizations to come together to develop a model to solve two vexing issues. One is a severe, obviously a severe shortage of affordable and supportive housing um, and in our area, an ever decreasing supply of quality manufacturing space and therefore quality jobs. The average job in one of our buildings, uh, the salary is over $52,000 a year. Our project will solve these real estate and land use issues and will serve as a model for others to replicate. Next slide, please. Hi, this is Penny King, Land Use Council for The Bridge. Um, the development site for this mixed use industrial and affordable housing development is located in the Brownsville neighborhood of Brooklyn on a block bounded by Rockaway Avenue, Newport Street, Thatford Avenue, and Riverdale Avenue. It is two blocks south of the Rockaway Avenue station on the three subway line. Next slide. To facilitate the proposed project, the applicant is seeking a zoning map amendment. The rezoning area would include sites that are not, not controlled by the applicant, including the community garden at the corner of Rockaway Avenue and Newport Street, and uh, a partial and two full lots to the north of the development site. A medium density R7A district would be mapped along Rockaway Avenue, which is a key neighborhood corridor. A slightly lower density R6A district would be mapped along Thatford Avenue, which is a narrow street with a lower rise character. These districts would be paired with an M14 district in the special mixed use district. Um, we are also seeking zoning, map, uh, zoning text amendments to establish the special mixed use district 19, establish an MIH area permitting option one, make inclusionary housing, FAR, and lot coverage uh, regulations applicable in MX19, and modify the use regulations in MX19. Next slide. The proposed text amendment would permit typical GMDC tenants, such as custom woodworking manufacturers or welders, to occupy a building containing residential uses. So these additional manufacturing uses would be permitted subject to a restrictive declaration requiring certain DEP approved building design measures. And as Brian mentioned, this could serve as a model for rezoning manufacturing districts to create new housing capacity while maintaining space for job producing industrial businesses. Next slide. The team took a very comprehensive approach to designing a mixed use industrial and residential building and worked with a team of consultants and the Department of Environmental Protection to identify and address potential issues like air quality and noise. 
we have developed a set of building design requirements that will be incorporated in a restrictive declaration and recorded against the property. We're happy to discuss these measures in more detail during the Q&A. Next slide. Um, as, as Brian said, this is a unique opportunity to preserve manufacturing, a manufacturing function, and also to develop badly needed affordable and supported housing in the community. On the ground floor, the ground floor, which will be owned and operated by GMDC, the plan okay. contains 30, 39,000 square feet of light manufacturing space, as well as a uh, 2,500 square foot community facility space and you can see in the bottom right corner, the uh, community garden, which will remain in place. You can also see the different entrances. GMDCs is on the busier Rockaway side. The residential entrance is on the Newport side and the community facility entrance is on the Thabford Avenue side. Next slide, please. The second floor uh, shows the community spaces within the building, including, um, including a, a quite large community garden. Uh, in the on the purple space, you have the social services office for the bridge staff that will work with the supported housing residents. Um, in the yellow spaces, you have the community spaces such as community rooms, computer lab, um, laundry room that are adjacent to the open space and accessible to the open, the 11,600 square foot uh, outdoor space. Next slide, please. And there's a view of the extremely uh, large uh, outdoor space, which will be accessible to all of the residents in the building. Next slide, please. So on the th this is the, this is the, tha the view from the Thatford uh, Avenue side of the building. As you can see, we've extended the ground floor of the building up to the street line to maximize the amount of manufacturing space that that, uh, that would be there. Um, above the first story, however, we set the building back in an angle so that the perceived building mass, um, to, to reduce the perceived building mass and increase the amount of visible sky from the surrounding streets. The building would incorporate a variety of materials, colors, textures, including two colors of brick, the light and the darker on the upper elevations and uh, colorful textured brick that angles a little bit on the ground floor. Next slide, please. Um, this is the Newport Street elevation. This is where the entrance to the housing would be. Um, to maximize the sunlight to the community garden, which, which is sort of on the front left corner, uh, the, that residential wing is angled away from Newport Street. The street walls facing the community garden and Newport Street now feature textured brick and the staggered pattern of windows to provide visual interest and create an attractive backdrop for the garden. Um, the, the issue about what the wall would look like that's adjacent to the community garden was something that uh, the uh, community board um, had expressed some interest in making sure that it didn't, it wasn't just a solid wall. On the right side of the community garden where you see the windows, um, we've sloped them so that it's, it, there's more window, um, reduces the amount of masonry and sort of creates a different uh, residential, uh, creates a different sort of facade. Um, next slide, please. And this is the Rockaway Avenue elevation. Um, similar to the Thatford side, the building, the residential portion of the building is set back above the ground level manufacturing space and is angled on this side as well to reduce the perceived building mass. Um, the ground floor manufacturing spaces, um, we've increased the size of the windows. They'll have six foot wide full height windows as well as windows above the bricks uh, that will provide visibility between the street and the manufacturing spaces, but maintaining enough solid wall to address the programmatic needs of the manufacturing tenants who will you know, at, be working within those spaces. Next slide, please. Um, just want to point out that this building is essentially 100% affordable. It's 50% permanent supportive housing 
for clients who uh, are living with behavioral health concerns and 50% affordable housing. Um, the, it's a 50-50 split. There's 87 supported units and 87 affordable units. Um, as you can see, the affordable units will be targeted to households with income of 30, 40, 50, and 70% of AMI. And as you can see from the unit size breakdown, um, we have created a significant number of two and three bedroom units that would be appropriate for families. Um, thank you. There's a lot of supplementary material in the addendums. Um, and thank you very much for considering our project. As Brian said, we really view it as a model. Um, we've spent a lot of time thinking about how this could work, and we believe it's a model that could be replicated. Thank you. Thank you. Let me see if there are questions. I'm sure there are. Commissioner De La Uz. <clears throat> Um, first, I just want to say I'm really excited uh, about this project. Um, excited about the affordable and supportive housing components. Excited about um, the industrial uses. And um, I just wanted to ask a follow-up question. I mean, you, you guys started to get into uh, a bit on one of the slides about some of the restrictions that, that DEP outlined in terms of the design measures. And I'm just wondering if... Um, one, how long that took, um, that conversation with DEP, and how much of that do you believe was very site-specific, and, um, and, and, and how much of it do you think might be applicable if this model would be replicated in the future? Um, I'll jump in. This is, I can, oh, go ahead, Brian. I'll, I'll first say it's, it's taken quite a while. Um, we've been working on this project for, um, I guess it's over three years now, um, and I do, uh, as a quick answer, Commissioner, um, I think that a lot of the work, uh, a large majority of the work um, that we do, did is not necessarily site specific, um, but it's work that can be used, as I said earlier, um, to replicate the model elsewhere. I think we've had great collaboration um, at DCP and at DEP, and then with our, our full team, whether it be Think or Mega, um, uh, the bridge and ourselves, and I mean it sincerely um, when we say that um, it's something that can be replicated based upon the ground uh, work that we've done um, over the last few years. That's great. I mean, I would just, um, I, I don't know how you're documenting uh, this in terms of the process and, um, you know, maybe reflecting on which things are, are more universal that, that you've developed in this model and which things are, are maybe more site specific, but I, I would just encourage you to document it and share it widely. Sure. We would be happy to do that. Further questions? Commissioner Levin. Well, just uh, not, a, not a question, but just following up on the um, li line of questioning here. This, um, this model was actually has, has been used in the Clinton Urban Renewal Area for affordable housing on top of um, an auto shop and a lumber yard that were on the site um, and needed to be accommodated. And it wasn't easy for them either. That one went through Euler quite a number of years ago, but Commissioner Deleuze is absolutely right. We should capture the knowledge and pain that um, both projects went through and try and see how it could be used elsewhere. Got a right. Further questions? Okay, uh, we will then uh, proceed to speakers in support of the project, uh, starting uh, for three minutes each, of course, uh, with Adam Friedman, who will be followed by Scott Burton, who will be followed by Jennifer uh, Cres Cresatelli. Crescatelli. Adam Friedman. Adam Friedman. Can you hear me all right? We can, thank you. Great. Sorry. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Adam Friedman, director of the Pratt Center for Community Development. I appreciate the opportunity to testify in support of the Bridge Rockaway application to create a special mixed use district and the related items to allow a great project and a great collaboration to move forward. 
Pratt Center runs the Made in NYC program, which serves about 1,400 local manufacturers. So I'm familiar with the status of the city's manufacturing sector and the needs Brian described earlier. The reasons for my support here really derive from my confidence that the developers can and will do what they say they're going to do. And you have a team of mission-driven people with great experience in the project before them. Mixed use development often presents a variety of problems from operational to enforcement challenges. But here, in addition to baking in provisions related to affordability, use restrictions, and environmental regulations into the zoning requirements, we have owner managers whose missions align with these policy objectives. In addition, there is the potential for just great programmatic synergy between the bridge, GMDC, and the community members from vocational training, jobs, and gardening to community space, spaces and activities. The co-location of these resources creates the type of opportunity for unique, unexpected encounters, which is part of the rationale for any mixed-use building or neighborhood. Finally, the world has changed post-COVID-19, and we're still in a recession. But from what I've seen, most of the manufacturing sector is recovering. Some sectors related to retailing and restaurants remain very hard hit, but others are rebounding. So I believe that the demand will be more than there. In the end, there will be lessons learned that can help inform our planning for mixed use buildings and neighborhoods moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Friedman? Uh, All righty, Scott Burton. Scott Burton. Hello? Mr. Burton? We can hear you, Mr. Burton. Hello? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Well, you've got three minutes. I'm in support of this program. It's not uh, um, because it will. Um, you can hear me. Okay. Yes, I'm in support of this of this um, program of the building. Can you hear me? Can yes, you hear me we now? can. Yes, we can. Yeah. Above this program and the building being services, so it's a great opportunity. Um, and I feel that it, it will definitely um, help people with um, physical and mental handicaps. Um, I've mm -hmm. been with the bridge since '97. It has greatly helped me out. I'm I'm in graduate housing. I have my own apartment now. I'm living. Um, off the Utica, East New York Avenue, and it's a great building and um, very secure. And uh, the program has really been a, a blessing. And I feel that um, for this future project, it will definitely um, be a blessing for those who are in need of it. And for those who are trying to, to try affordable housing and to, um, live a better life in taking care of themselves and their family. And I do uh, appreciate um, the people who, who have, have developed the project and putting their time and money into it. And it will definitely be uh, an outstanding project for those who are all in concern. And I just want to say um, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak on it. And I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Burton. Thank you for your testimony. Thank uh, you. Are there any questions for Mr. Burton? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burton. Jennifer Crescatelli. Good afternoon. 
Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, my name is Jennifer Crescitelli. I'm an AVP with The Bridge in their residential services. And I wanted to just take a moment and briefly describe some of the great work that we do in our other housing, which has mixed housing and Office of Mental Health clients as well. Um, our services are important. We believe that being part of the community and entering into a community and while teaching our residents how to be productive is very, very key to their success. Uh, some of the services that we do offer, I think was mentioned a little bit earlier, but we do have case managers who see our residential clients from the Office of Mental Health twice a month. We work very hard to make sure that they have the proper referrals for psychiatric and medical care. Um, and in this new world, we've had to learn how to help people do telehealth and telemental health, which has been a challenge that we've met and been successful at. Some of our groups and wellness activities are really important for building community. We do a lot of art and writing. We do have financial groups to teach people about how to spend their money in their neighborhood and where to save. We work a lot on vocational and educational or volunteer settings for people to be able to get some new skills and um, feel like they're contributing. I think that one of the biggest lessons that we work on and have had success with is around being a good neighbor and figuring out what it is that we can do to support the community, but also how our clients can be appropriate within that setting. I think that it is this particular project is extraordinarily exciting to me because it's very different, but I also think that what's important is that we've taken all of our lessons learned in other projects and we're moving it forward to try something different and better. So I appreciate your time. I appreciate um, your willingness to hear me out and um, thank you. Thank you. Questions for Ms. Crescitelli? Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, Ryan, are there any uh, further speakers on this item? Let me check the, the registry just one moment. <clears throat> All right. Um, there are no further speakers on this item. Thank you. Uh, there being no further speakers, this hearing is closed. Our next item. Borough Brooklyn, calendar number 15, CD1, C200158, ZMK. A public hearing in the matter of an application for a zoning map amendment concerning Bedford Avenue overlay extension. Okay, uh, our first speaker is the applicant, Benjamin Stark. Hi, can, uh, can you hear me? Yes. I can. We can. Yes. Am, am I? Am I? Can I be seen, or I'm just curious? Uh, you cannot be seen. Okay, that's okay. Um, oh, hi again. My my name is Ben Stark. I'm with the law firm Hirsch and Singer and Epstein. I represent the applicant here, um, which is a two two three Troutman LLC, uh, which is not not to confuse uh, uh, with the site in question, which is uh, at, uh, at the corner of. Of Bedford Avenue and North First Street uh, at 276 Bedford Avenue. Um, as this opening slide indicates, this is an application um, to in ex extend an existing for commercial overlay um, over a vacant property, like I said, the corner of North First Street and Bedford Avenue. Uh, this application uh, does not call for any change to the underlying uh, R6B zoning designation. It is simply to add uh, commercial overlay. Um, and this uh, application, if approved, would facilitate development of a new three-story building. Um, uh, and uh, the building would include some ground floor, uh, ground floor commercial use as facilitated by the rezoning um, with just two residential units above. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned, this is on the corner of North First Street, Bedford Avenue in Williamsburg. Uh, the, the site, which we'll, we'll, we'll show in just a minute, is a, a 2,700 square foot parcel. Uh, the site uh, is, is, is currently uh, partially within an existing C24 commercial overlay, um, about 20% of the lot area. And so this application uh, would, would allow for the full 
uh, development site to be within this commercial overlay. And we'll, we'll add some graphics in just a bit to show you that condition. Uh, next slide, please. And here we are, we're, uh, uh, as mentioned, corner of Bedford Avenue, North First Street. Uh, this is a very active area of, of Williamsburg. We've got Grand Street um, at the top of the screen or, or more towards the top. Uh, Metropolitan is just a block to the, to the uh, below you, to, to the north. To the north. So we're kind of spun around and we're looking south actually here. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a, a great little image here that, as I'm sure all you're familiar with, the, the 1930s tax photos, uh, just showing the most the, the, the most recent building uh, on this now vacant site, uh, a three-story uh, mixed-use building, very um, uh, 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 typical of, of the area and of the time. Uh, next, please, next slide, please. Uh, and here we have just an illustrative uh, photo. Uh, at this time, no, no materi materials uh, or window treatments have, have been selected for this, for this uh, proposed development, but we produced this, this rendering uh, simply to show the relationship of the proposed building mass um, to, to the existing context. Uh, and and this, this shows, as you can see, you know, ground floor uh, commercial occupying the entirety of the lot area uh, with the two stories of residential above. Next slide, please. This is the, uh, the current condition of the site, although this photo was probably from at least a year ago. Uh, we, we're seeing the, the vacant lot uh, uh, after that the uh, demolition of that building you saw from the tax photos from our estimate sometime um, in the 70s or 80s that, that that building was demolished. And a lot of people know this vacant site, or, we, or at least we've, we've come to learn that a lot of neighbors know this vacant site because of uh, uh, some, some unique lawn gnomes that have, have made appearances over the years uh, I... in, in the grass yard. Uh, next slide, please. Time. Oh, time. Okay, Mr. Stark, your three minutes uh, have run. Let me see if there are uh, any questions for you. Questions for Mr. Stark. Commissioner De La Uz, uh, followed by Commissioner Bernie. Hi, thanks for being here. Um, I appreciate the historical photo. Um, that's, that's helpful. Um, I guess the, the question I have, uh, is there already an intended commercial use for the, for the site? Mr. Stark, did you hear that question? I, I did, I was, I was muted, but now I'm, I'm unmuted. Uh, I, no, at this time, uh, no uh, uh, commercial tenant has been identified. I, from my understanding is that there, there were conversations between our, uh, my client and, and potential tenants um, in, in the previous year, but, but that those conversations have gone on ice uh, you know, with the ongoing um, uh, issues that we've all are quite familiar with. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's about it. Further questions, Commissioner De La Uz? No, thank you. Okay, Commissioner Bernie? Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Stock. You mentioned that the rendering you showed is very preliminary and no materials have been selected and so on. Would we have an opportunity to see an updated rendering before it moves out of this part of the process? Um, that's something I can, that I can get back to the, the, the commission with. Um, uh, Sure. Yeah, we, we can. Uh, you know, we we've been working to think more about you know the design of this building uh, on the interior and you know what what some of the um, you know working with our engineers to understand some of the structural issues. Uh, so we haven't really gotten to the stage of materiality, but you know I can see if we can you know speed those those conversations up and and perhaps get back to the, the commission, if not with an updated rendering or but, but maybe with a, a further explanation of where, where uh, this developer's head's at with, with that. Thank you, thank you very much. Commission 11. Uh, yes, Mr. Stark, you got cut off just as you were uh, telling us about garden gnomes, which sort of begs a follow-up question, but um, which you might, I don't know if you have an answer to or not, or there's more you want to tell us about the gnomes, but my real question was in that image, there was a for sale sign on the property. Um, is it your client who responded to that for sale sign or is the property? That, 
That's, That's right. right. And, and actually, at the time that we uh, first filed this application, uh, my client was contract vendee um, to purchase the property. They have since closed. So they are okay. the owner. Um, okay. The closing happened in uh, sometime in the spring, okay. um, in the midst of all of this. So uh, yeah, they are the owner. Okay. Thanks for the clarification. Further questions from Mr. Starr? Apparently not. Uh, thank you, Mr. Stark. Um, Ryan, is there anyone else present who would there like to? No, yeah, there are no further speakers uh, registered for this item. All right. Uh, there are no further speaking. If no further speakers, then this hearing is closed. Our next item is our last item for public hearing today. Borough of Manhattan, calendar number 16. CD8N200078ZRM, a public hearing in the matter of an application for a zoning text amendment concerning the Mansion Restaurant Sidewalk Cafe. All righty. Uh, we have speaking in favor of this item. Uh, our first speaker is Neil Weisbrod. Neil Weisbrod. Hi, how are you? Good afternoon, Vice Chair. Commissioner is Neil Weisbard from Prior Cashman, and I appear before you on behalf of Yorkville Mansion, Inc., who operates the Mansion Diner, located at 1634 York Avenue. Next slide, please. This text amendment is seeking an amendment to Section 1441 of Zoning Resolution to allow an unenclosed sidewalk cafe on the north side of East 86th Street within 125 feet of east, east of York Avenue. Enclosed, side, enclosed sidewalk cafes will still not be permitted in such area. Next slide. This area is determined based on the following land use considerations. Next slide, please. To coincide with the C15 commercial district located on the north side of East 86th Street. Next slide, please. Sidewalk cafes are already permitted on both York Avenue and East 85th Street, but only within the C15 commercial district. Next slide. And also on East 87th Street, but only within the C15 commercial district. Next slide. Therefore, there's no reason to include this area in the text amendment. Next slide, please. I'll go quickly. Uh, the portions to Within the R10A, obviously sidewalk cafes are not permitted there, so this area is not included. Next slide. Next slide. And there was a bit, it's not, the text amendment is, does not include the south side of East 86th Street because this area is going to be developed with a long care term facility, so it was not needed on such side and wouldn't make sense. Next slide, please. Next slide. The EAS determined that un unenclosed sidewalk cafes could easily be accommodated on that stretch of the street without negatively impacting the flow of pedestrian traffic. Next slide. And EAR EARD issued a negative deck. Next slide, please. Uh, the community board issued a favorable recommendation as did Borough President Gail Brewer. Next slide, please. Based on these considerations, there is a land use justification for the text amendment. Next slide. The proposed unclosed cafe will include 10 tables, 36 chairs, a removable railing, and a retractable awning. Next slide, please. Here is a plan of the sidewalk cafe. Next slide, please, which shows you a blow up of the sidewalk cafe. Uh, there's a 10 foot, 11 foot clearance at, by a tree and also a 10 foot, six foot, 10 foot, six inch clearance by the fire hydrant. Next slide, please. This is the area where this will be located. Next slide, please. Uh, this just gives you a sense of how wide the sidewalk here is. The tape is where the border of the sidewalk cafe will be. And there's plenty of room for pedestrians. Next slide, please. I, the next slide was just a of text of the text amendment. And I have the owners and operators of the mansion diner 
Phil and John Phillips, which has been in operation since 1945. So if the commission has any questions, they're here to answer any questions. Okay, uh, is, is, is it Wise Bard or Wise Broad? Wise Bard. Wise Bard. All right, yes. I had Wise Broad. I don't no know problem. how anyone at city planning could have made such a mistake. We'll have to look into that. <laughs> uh, but are any questions for Mr. Wise Bard? Wait a minute, let me, questions. Uh, Commissioner De La Uz, followed by Commissioner Levin. So, so first, I just want to say I really appreciate the pictures, um, including the pictures that, that show how wide the sidewalk is after uh, the proposed space would, would be um, accommodated. And I, I guess I'm just curious, um, you know, just given uh, COVID and all that has been going on, um, how, how's the restaurant doing um, and how would the proposed um, sidewalk cafe kind of build on what is now being allowed um, in, in terms of street use um, due to COVID? So I'm going to let John Phillips answer most of that question, but the restaurant has been operating under the open restaurants program with 60 seats. And understandably, the mayor's order has been extended permanently. And we have so far along in the application that just in case the mayor's order is ever rescinded, this application will proceed if approved and will allow the mansion to move forward with seats even after the mayor's executive order. And if John and Phil Phillips are on the phone, father and son, and they can tell you what it's been like operating through this terrible time. So if you could- Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll take uh, Mr. Phillips and um, the other gentleman in sequence. Just let me see if there are um, Mr. Phillips and Mr. Wagoda. Uh, let me see if there's any other questions for uh, Mr. Weisbard. I think there was. Commissioner Levin? Uh, yes, and it's really just a detailed question, but when you showed the slide of the proposed um, plan and site plan, it was a little bit different than the one we have in our briefing packet. We had a, an image that showed um, a service aisle going down between sort of pairs of tables. Um, and with uh, 23 tables and 47 seats. And you showed us a plan that had 10 tables and 36 seats. Can you yes. Start, start, start on which one we should be looking at? So the one that is included in the PowerPoint is the plan that, we, that the mansion will move forward with. That was based on some of the concerns of Community Board 8. And so oh. the Phillips have no issues with reducing the number of tables and chairs to what's presented in the PowerPoint. Okay, that's help, helpful explanation. Thank you for that. It's kind of beside the point for us because this is just a text amendment removing the prohibition. Um, we're not approving a particular layout, but um, I appreciate the clarification. Thank you. Okay, okay further questions for Mr. Weisbard. If not, we'll move on to John Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Good morning. Good afternoon. How is everyone? Fine. Please proceed. To put outdoor seating for the better part of the last two years. Um, naturally, as a result of COVID, um, we've been permitted to, um, to keep pace with, um, with the guidelines for how we are supposed to be doing business with 25% inside and the outdoor seating. Um, as Neil Weisbard mentioned, we, we are pretty far into this process and so we don't see any reason not to continue with our petition for the text change. You have more time, sir, do you wish to say more? Uh, no, I, I don't. Um, I'm certainly available to answer any questions you may have. Um, Neil did, uh, did bring up the key points. We've been on this corner since 1945. Me, my father, my, and my, uh, the rest of my family were born and raised on this corner. Um, the restaurant is still in operation, and we plan to be in operation for many years to come. The consideration for the outdoor cafe was essentially a tool to allow us to keep pace with the growing neighborhood, 
Um, they just built a 21 story building behind me and are in the process of completing another 16 story building right across the street. Naturally, the necessity for the outdoor cafe is to help us deal with this large influx of people into our what used to be residential neighborhood. Um, All righty. Phil Phillips, my father, would like to also share my time, um, if that's okay with the board. No, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll call on Mr. Uh, we'll go to uh, uh, next. Are there any uh, uh, questions for uh, Mr. Phillips from any commissioner? All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Wagoda? Hello? Hello. Hi. We can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't have much to say except two things. One, um, uh, Mr. Knuckles, I remember working with you at DGS with Ann Papa George and Ray Devine. It goes back a while. Um, and secondly, hear from you. yeah, same here. We did the, they're all survivors of DGS. That's, that's good to know. <laughs> yeah. We did all the correctional work uh, back right. then. It was a right. good program. Um, secondly, my firm, uh, SWA has designed over a thousand uh, sidewalk cafes in New York. And, um, and I actually live near, uh, Phil's, the, you know, the mansion, they're, they're, really an, they're really an iconic location for New York City. Um, so, um, you know, obviously we designed it. We work with Neil. Neil's been a good leader on this, on this venture. Um, you know, we've obtained another uh, Maz Mescal, which is across the street between first and second, got the same relief on uh, text amendment. And they've been operating. So hopefully, um, hopefully this could work for the community and for the Phillips family. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Steve Wagoda. Uh, good to hear from you. Uh, any questions for Mr. Wagoda? Apparently there is not. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you, gentlemen, for your testimony um, this morning, uh, this afternoon, actually. Um, Ryan, are there any further speakers on this item? Um, there's no further uh, speakers in the in the participants list. Let me check the registration just one moment. Uh, there are no further speakers, no. All righty, then the hearing is closed. <clears throat> Mr. Secretary, uh, is there any other business before the commission today? Uh, there is no additional business. However, I do have a minor housekeeping matter, uh, just a, a passage I'd like to read. Uh, for those of you who are unable to or did not wish to testify, you can submit written testimony online by selecting this hearing on the upcoming meetings page of the NYC Engage portal through DCP's webpage or by mailing your comment to City Planning Commission, Calendar Information Office, 120 Broadway, 31st floor, New York, New York, 10271. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, if there is no further business before the commission than this remotely held meeting for uh, October 7th, 2020 is hereby adjourned. This concludes the remote public meeting of the New York City Planning Commission for Wednesday, October 7th, 2020. The time is 1.29 p.m. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you Thank all. You. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye, guys.